I beg to remind senators that when the Senate rose, resolution was passed to authorize the Minister of Finance to guarantee an overdraft facility in the amount of 3.5 million EC dollars from the Republic Bank, Eastern Caribbean Limited to the St. Jude Hospital for the purpose of assisting with working capital requirements. Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I wish to move for the, I wish to proceed um, with the following motion, standing in my name. Whereas, it is provided under Section 63.1 of the Public Finance Management Act, Cap 1501, the Act <coughs> that the Minister of Finance may, by an affirmative resolution of Parliament, borrow from a bank or other financial institution for the capital or current expenditure of government. And whereas, it is further provided under Section 64 of the Act that money borrowed by the government must be paid into and form part of the consolidated fund. And whereas, the Minister of Finance considers it necessary to borrow U.S. 9 million 867,000 from the ordinary capital resources of the Caribbean Development Bank allocated from the European Investment Bank's second action line of credit, of credit component resources, the loan, for the implementation of the building public health resilience coronavirus disease 2019 response project. And whereas the loan is repayable, in 76 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments, commencing three years after the date of the loan agreement. And whereas, interest at the variable rate of 4.0% per annum is payable quarterly on the amount of the principal disbursed and outstanding from time to time. And whereas, a commitment fee set at a rate of 1% per annum is payable quarterly on the amount disbursed, sorry, undisbursed from time to time, commencing from the sixth, 60th day after the date of the loan agreement. Be it resolved that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow US 9,867,000 from the ordinary capital resources of the Caribbean Development Bank allocated from the European Investment Bank Second Climate Action Line of Credit Component Resources, the loan, for the implementation of the building public health resilience coronavirus disease 2019 response project. <coughs> Be it further resolved that A, the loan is repayable in 76 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments commencing three years after the date of the loan agreement. B, the interest at the variable rate of 4.06% per annum is payable quarterly on the amount of the principal disbursed and outstanding from time to time. C, a commitment fee of a rate of 1% per annum is payable quarterly on the amount is undisbursed from time to time, commencing from the 60th day after the date of the loan agreement. Are you? Yes, I'm waiting for you. Madam President, I wish to provide some further details and explanation for the purpose of presenting this motion. As was mentioned, to borrow about 9.867 million US for post-COVID uh, 
um, <clears throat> as was described by the, the motion, post-COVID resilience. Um, like I did mention earlier, Madam President, when we debated the first motion, we are going to be uh, expected, and in this particular sitting, there'll be another motion. And as was all already established with among um, some of our colleague senators, this government's attempts to secure financing in most of our sittings have been focused on health care. Madam President, this motion is very similar in terms of its purpose. This one, in this case, the focus is on building resilience and strengthening our health sector. In the previous motion, I made reference to some examples. And in this case, I want to make mention of further other examples that some of the monies secured in this, in this loan will be used for. Madam President, the areas will include infrastructure or infrastructure works. It will include building resilience. It will include medical equipment and medication. So I just want to give a few examples of some of the areas in which monies will be expended. Madam President, we know, like I mentioned in the first, during the first motion, that the PR for continuing to encourage communication, risk communication to be more precise, is necessary both in communicable, uh, non-communicable uh, diseases, as well as making sure that the public is aware of the goods and services that are available to them uh, for public health purposes. Madam President, one of the other areas that I mentioned was with respect to infrastructure, our health infrastructure, particularly physical health infrastructure. Some of these monies, Madam President, will be spent to rehabilitate and improve some of the structures. And I want to, at this time, mention one such area that is located in the community near my, or where my colleague, Senator Polios, is from. I did say near, near. So I make reference to a community. I am cautious not to say constituency because in this chamber we're not constituency reps. But in the constituency of Denry North, one of the uh, facilities that will be receiving attention is the Larishus Wellness Center. And it has been clearly established that this particular facility provides services for a very large catchment area in what we call the Mabuya Valley. And that health center, as we have heard from the MP, um, is one that was really, I, I, I heard it so many times, it was, a, it was a, a chorus that it was not being considered for improvement. Whatever the reasons, I don't want to go in there, I'm not the rep, but I am happy that we are seeing that some of this money um, will be going towards for, for, uh, the, the improvement works of infrastructure works on that facility. Suffice to say, Madam President, I also want to, want to um, remind the Senate that before the life of this pre present government, the money that was available for the works at the Larissa Health Center was actually grant funding, money that we would not have had to borrow. And again, it takes me back to a point I made in response to the rebuttal, where we are in a position as a government where we now have to find money to be borrowed to deal with situations where we had money that we didn't have to borrow. Grant funding was available for that particular health center. The money was secured by the Liberal Party government and it was a line item in their budget prior to 2016. So the money was there, it was provided for in the budget, but for some reason, 
the the the, the government then opposite the then oppos uh, government now opposition did not see it fit to embark on that project and so it was allowed not to be done but we have come back about six and a half years later to have to, to make the commitment, to keep the commitment we made and make sure that this, this health center is being done. Unfortunately, Madam President, this time, since the monies were used, we don't know what for, we now have to borrow. Madam President, there are other examples of infrastructure and I want to mention now the establishment of the Castries Urban Polyclinic. The, we know that there have been pressures on the health center in the city of Castries on Chosey Road um, and the, the number of people that it serves. And I'm very happy to see that in this particular situation, some of these monies will be used towards the improvement and refurbishment of what we had as, the, as VH to, be, to serve the purpose of an urban polyclinic for the Castries Basin. Madam President, in addition to the infrastructure works, I now want to mention a few examples where um, some of this money will be going towards medical equipment and uh, medication. We heard from the opposition earlier the concern mm -hmm. about the availability of equipment and they're hoping that the monies will be borrowed for this and monies will be borrowed for that. Well, from the list that Senator Stanislas mentioned, I can point out a few of the very things that he mentioned that this particular loan is going to address. And let me now list a few of them. We have procuring of medication for non-communicable diseases, hypertension and diabetes, and we know what that can do if you have these pre-existing conditions and you get COVID. We know what happens when you suffer from these conditions. And these will be purchased and made available to the people um, so that they can access that medication. X-ray machines. In addition to the, to the mobile one that Senator, Lee, uh, Senator Jean mentioned, X-ray machines will be made available to the primary health care facilities. And that for me is a welcome addition because, addition because that, uh, the absence of an X-ray machine in a healthcare facility can be a major inconvenience. Show up with a broken limb or some kind of fracture and then you have to be transported miles away just to get an X-ray. Um, pain, inconvenience and time sometimes can make the difference between somebody surviving or not surviving or a minor injury becoming a major issue. Madam President, I also want to make mention of the procurement of equipment for some of our health facilities, including Comfort Bay in the South that houses our senior citizens. So in that case, we are paying attention to every aspect. The Comfort Bay is, is a very important institution. For those of us who think we'll never get old, one of these days, one of us may end up there and be very happy that there are people and their facilities to make us comfortable, where we can enjoy the company of our peers, people of our age. Madam President, another facility I wish to mention, in addition to Comfort Bay, is the Viewfort um, and Grosile Polyclinic. This, the Viewfort Health Center, the Grosile Polyclinic, which is almost like a mini hospital in the north. You know the population of the uh, Rodney Bay and Grosile area, very densely populated part of the country, and medical emergencies and situations come up very often. So that is a very essential uh, medical facility in that, in that part of the country. And that, equip, that um, equipment and uh, equipment as well as the pharmaceuticals will be made available in these facilities. The Minister of Health, Madam President, mentioned the, uh, a bus being uh, secured. And I think that one is a very necessary one. Because sometimes, you know, the movement of, of equipment and, the, and making things available to people where they are is an issue. 
I have seen elderly folk trying to get a bus to, to be able to go to a, a medical facility just to get a few, you know, what, um, tablets, pills, just to be able to get, a, 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 get something from a prescription. And they have to wait hours. And they, have, so they may not have money to buy water. I've seen them, you know, it's, it's, it's not right, Madam President. And that bus will be used to distribute pharmaceuticals to areas like Sufre um, and environs. So you're taking the service and the, the, the medication to the people where they are. And that's what, it, that's what we mean by putting people first. Getting the service and getting the necessary um, uh, pharmaceuticals and medication to them. So, Madam President, that bus obviously is going to, to make it easier for some people to access what they need. Another one that I want to mention, Madam President, is this, the procuring and provision of security cameras. And that has become a concern. I want to make a reference to a personal experience. I, I am from the community of Deriso, and we have a health center there that was refurbished some time ago. And one of the concerns I've had is that I've heard many times that there have been some break-ins. And the nurse, the resident nurse, or the community, I, I think they call them the FNP, the family nurse practitioner, the person who usually occupies the space, she has personally reached out to me to complain. Um, I have to remind her that I'm not the MP, but you know when, when they don't see the MP, they, they look for the next best option, and that usually falls in <laughs> on my shoulders. She has too often, because they never see any, they never, they never have an MP to reach out to. So she has reached out to me to plead with the, the, the powers that be to ensure that there is some kind of security measures, whether it's be a security officer or cameras or whatever is, 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 is necessary. And I, I don't like mentioning names, but I can tell you, Madam President, that Nurse Xavier will be very happy to hear that uh, security cameras will be made available at these primary health care facilities that include the Deriso Health Center. And I'm very, very pleased when I notice that this will be done. Um, because too often there have been break-ins and stuff going missing and people begin to feel uncomfortable. So, Madam President, these are some of the examples of the expenditure, what will be done with the monies that we are here to borrow. So, Madam President, I can move on and, and mention a few others, but I, I know we have another motion that is going to focus on health care to come. So, I will pause here and ask that the Senate considers, given what these monies are designated for, given the need that exists in our country for these services and these um, this, especially the medication to be made available to the, the people who need them, that we will see it fit to support this motion and approve the borrowing for that purpose. I thank you, Madam President. Senators, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow U.S. 9 million $867,000 from the ordinary capital resources of the Caribbean Development Bank allocated from the European Investment Bank Second Climate Action Line of Credit Component Resources, the loan, for the implementation of the Building Public Health Resilience Coronavirus Disease 2019 Response Project. Be it further resolved that A, the loan is repayable in 76 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments commencing three years after the date of the loan agreement. B, interest at the variable rate of 4.06 per annum is payable quarterly on the amount of the principal disbursed and outstanding from time to time and C, a commitment fee at a rate of 1% per annum is payable quarterly on the amount undisbursed from time to time, commencing from the 60th day after the date of the loan agreement. Senator Fede. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, I 
rise to add my voice to this motion to borrow nine million eight hundred and sixty seven thousand US dollars from the Caribbean Development Bank for public health resilience and coronavirus disease response um, Madam President if I had to do a conversion into Eastern Caribbean dollars to be over an amount of 25 million dollars that we are talking about and that the um, executive my colleague has made it um, necessary for us to point out that the executive which is the one that's driving the administration of government um, is, co is seeking the approval of the house to borrow um, Madam President, we're talking about this motion or we're debating this motion whilst we near the end of the COVID-19 response globally, regionally and nationally. And um, I want to say that I remember the height of the pandemic quite well because it was a very difficult time. Madam President, it was a time of mass unemployment in the country. I remember waking up one morning and seeing an entire economy shut down. But it required uh, an approach, Madam President, where we had to beef up the capacity of the health service then to deal with the extra demands for health care needs which was brought about because of this global pandemic which St. Lucia was entangled in. Uh, it is very, very interesting to note that several years later that we're still going through um, the burden of or the onerous um, reality of he extra health care cost. Today it's 27 million. So just imagine how much it would have cost us then um, in the height of the pandemic. And that is without an economic situation that exists now where the economy is at, at full throttle, I would say, or better throttle, in fact, um, without little interruptions. And so what this is showing is how COVID-19 has been such a debilitating force and how it has managed to disrupt the um, economic, fiscal, and financial realities of governments. That even towards the end of the response now, here comes a government that requires $27 million. It then begs the question, Madam President, how much more with a government then dealing with the height of the pandemic without the necessary economic conditions to deal with it. The world economic order was totally shocked and um, decimated by this health crisis of which they had not seen uh, at such a proportion and at such a level. So now, I want to focus a bit though on some of the things that were required then. To deal with First of all, we had to establish a command center to deal with the COVID-19 initiative. And this was a, a very um, interagency exchange and working together, uh, a lot of work between the Ministry of Health, um, the National Security Ministry, uh, in ministries like tourism, agriculture, a whole gamut of um, ministries, public sector agencies that came together to, to make this possible and to really cause a very effective response um, by St. Lucia at that time uh, to a problem that the Caribbean had not seen before. And so we also had to ensure that we establish a, a respiratory hospital. So Victoria Hospital, um, which was the main hospital at the time, uh, became the respiratory hospital uh, to beef up the health services. We got the assistance of the Cuban Medical Brigade. And I remember 
um, being tasked with the responsibility to fly them in, Madam President. And at that time, the borders of all the Caribbean countries were shut. And then I realized what a nightmare it was to work with uh, various Caribbean governments. Because here you have countries that were dealing with their own domestic COVID response. And then here you are trying to fly um, scores of Cuban um, medical professionals in doctors and nurses and um, respiratory experts to come to help us to fight this national pandemic uh, that we were facing at the time. And then uh, attempts were made to fly them through the Cayman Islands. As you know, there are limitations with um, Cubans flying through the US, which is where our air service would traditionally be connected to. And then um, we finally got them through a Turks and Caicos airline. We had to charter a plane to go get them. And, and so it, it happened, we made it look seamless, but it wasn't easy. It was a very challenging time. And so to see that this government um, is now even having to go through uh, you know, the burdensome need to finance the back end of, or the tail end of the pandemic. It is quite intriguing, I would say. We had to also beef up the Ezra Long Lab because no one had catered to COVID-19 and the lab obviously had a certain capacity of testing. And um, when we had a lot of returning nationals come back for Christmas, then you were faced with the complex problem. Here are St. Lucians returning home. You have a certain policy pertaining to U.S. visitors that are coming in. What is that policy going to be for U.S. St. US citizens who are St. Lucian nationals, St. Lucian born nationals returning home? And um, of course, I remember that December over Christmas, we had an outbreak which then placed a lot of burden on the capacity of the lab. It meant in quick time, you had to then beef up the capacity of the lab to ensure that we were testing, but not just testing, but testing on time to make sure that we were able to deal with the challenges placed on individuals that are traveling in and out of St. Lucia for tourism purposes, for your own testing in terms of your medical response to the problem. And then we, we also, beefed up the capacity of the forensic lab to join that national fight so that the country was then ably equipped with the necessary tools to ensure that we were testing and testing and ensure that we met all the testing needs necessary in the country. Then we had to get ventilators in. I, I remember seeing the city of New York very early in the pandemic um, challenge to get uh, ventilators, where Governor Cuomo at the time was pleading with the federal government to send him resources because um, they just didn't have enough ventilators. But we had enough for our particular situation in St. Lucia uh, because our medical people were so on top of their game, making sure that they move proactively to get the necessary resources that St. Lucia required at the time to respond to this um, ravaging uh, pandemic which affected us. And then we had to get quarantine facilities. When people come into the country, um, I saw that there were some um, governments around the Caribbean. I saw pictures of them using schools and community centers. And we were using hotels in St. Lucia because the tourism sector was actually shut down completely and that meant that we had available hotel beds which became, um, became available for the um, people coming into the country to be able to quarantine them in an effective way so that they can do their quarantine time over the 14 day period that it required for the virus to dissipate. Protocols, the protocols to protect the population both from the uh, tourism um, public that was coming in 
and as well as returning nationals that were coming in. Um, and so those protocols really had to be customized. When we were dealing with the, um, the issue of our borders being open and reopening our economy, which is tourism dependent, it meant that you had to have the necessary protocols where people coming from all over the world do not see these protocols as a disincentive to travel, but instead there was a happy medium struck between people being able to get in and out in a very seamless manner, but at the same time to manage the or any potential spread of the virus. Madam President, that was on the health side some of the major things that we did. But accompanied with the health problems that we face were a lot of economic challenges. And you would remember very, very well that it was about saving lives and livelihoods. It was a, a mantra that the world had taken on to make sure that they did both simultaneously so that they could have had a more effective response to the virus. Um, we saw 15,000 jobs lost in the hospitality sector. 15,000 people just in one industry, the tourism industry. We saw a 24% economic contraction at the time. Um, we were dealing with all of that, a 20% shortfall in the revenue. Overnight, the country saw significant uh, reductions in its revenue levels. But despite all of this, Madam President, we were able to pay civil servants' salaries on a monthly basis and did not miss a single month of their salaries. And we were able to do it. We were able to ensure that St. Lucia's international reputation was safeguarded and sustained so that we were able to pay the debt and meet the debt burden on a monthly basis. So all of the treasury bonds and the bills which became due on a monthly basis, we were able to ensure that we pay those. Most importantly, 11,000 NIC registrants, people who were unemployed, they got income support, Madam President, from the NIC at the time. It required us to come to the parliament and to uh, have a piece of sunset legislation that would cause the NIC Act to be amended. And by amending the NIC Act, what we were able to do was indeed to um, expand the functions of the NIC for a six month period where it wasn't just offering uh, uh, pension or um, sick leave or, or sick benefits, but it was also offering income support for the six month period when we made the amendment to the legislation. And that, was, that really allowed 11,000 people to gain some level of income support. There were another 6,000 unregistered people who um, were not part of this. And so what the difference now is people are back at work. We, we ensure that we recover the economy, but, but then there were 6,000 taxi drivers, vendors, um, bar owners, people who own little restaurants and shopkeepers, and all of these people were out of work with no coverage in the national insurance scheme because they simply weren't contributors. They're self-employed individuals. This did two things. We were able to go to the World Bank to get the necessary funding and to borrow money and uh, to then make monies available to these individuals so that they too can be part of the income support. We didn't just promise income support. We didn't promise to triple the income support and not do it. But we actually went out there and did it, Madam President. And that is the difference in that we delivered this to 6,000 people in a very difficult economic circumstance because we understood that people were bleeding and people were suffering. 
And so in these circumstances, you cannot just make empty promises to people, but you've got to deliver on what you say that you will. And so I'm very proud of our efforts here. But I remember though in a previous sitting that the Minister of Finance indicated that the NIC registrations were on the uptick. And what we saw and predicted then when we were doing this is by bringing a lot of these unregistered people into the pool and by offering them the income support, it then allowed them the opportunity to become registered and become uh, part of the national insurance scheme. And so I want to say that as a result of that very difficult time uh, during COVID-19, we had a great opportunity to ensure that there was greater coverage for more individuals, individuals who were left exposed with no insurance policy to cover them in case they were sick, in case uh, they got into old age, no coverage. So I am very happy that that result was what actually came out of a very, 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 very difficult situation. Madam President, I remember when we were trying to reopen the economy to bring about um, economic opportunities for a lot of people, there were a lot of voices who said that we were bringing the tourists to give the locals COVID. I remember that very well. I remember that very, very well. I sat in this, in this very house and I debated then and I said, we have got to find a way to coexist with COVID. We have got to find a way to ease up the burden on the national insurance scheme. And we've got to find a way to put people back at work. I am very happy that we didn't listen to those voices then. And we didn't cower. And we rose to the, the occasion with courage. And we said that the planes that we saw parked on the airports all over the world was St. Lucia's opportunity. And what we did, Madam President, is that we went out into the world. We met with the Ministry of Health team. And we said that together we can be the first to reopen our borders. We can be the first to responsibly allow tourists coming into the country to stimulate economic opportunity, even in this dire circumstance of COVID-19. And we were able to do that. And I am very, very proud of the work done by the staff of the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Tourism, and the magnificent role that they all played in making sure that St. Lucia won, that St. Lucia get on top of what was a difficult situation. And so why, why I'm saying this, Madam, Madam President, is that it shows you the fact that we're coming to borrow this 25, 26 million, I don't know what it is in EC dollars, the fact that we're coming to borrow this money here today shows you how bad it was back then. Shows you the challenges we faced, how complex they were to, to bring supplies in and out of the country to, to, to battle with the, uh, the situation, to get, to get test kits into the country at that time was an amazing feat because the borders were closed. When we talk about the global supply chain right now, this is where it started. It started then with people having demands for simple supplies, like especially for the health sector and uh, food commodities in general, um, household uh, needs that we had at that time. It was impossible to get a container into the country or to get them moved from the production centers of the world to consumers like us in the small island developing states. And so, very intriguing, because it does jerk my memory to a more complex time in uh, the governance of our country. 
And so I, I, I thought it was worthwhile to bring it up. But the opportunity was there. We went to the airlines and we said, look, you need to start flying again. And out of that, Madam President, we saw airlift into this country to help with the economic recovery of COVID like we had not seen before. For the first time in the history of tourism development in this country, we had American Airlines flying from Chicago. For the first time in the history of tourism development in this country, we had a flight out of the state of Texas coming via American Airlines from Dallas. For the first time as we responded to COVID, for the first time in the history, we saw JetBlue flying out of New Jersey. After 27 years of being out of business in the uh, New York JFK airport, Madam President, we saw American Airlines resuming service, direct service to the island. We saw American Airlines increasing capacity in Miami. Unfortunately, Madam President, those gains that we had during COVID, we did not sustain those flights and those routes so that St. Lucia could better recover economically from the disruption that take place as a result of the economic um, decimation that COVID-19 caused. And so we see today, and I haven't seen a report this year yet, but our research shows us that there has been a 31% drop in air capacity from the United States market. And so, therefore, Madam President, President the shift has to be to ensure that we promote, you have a question? 31% drop in air capacity out of the U.S. market. American Airlines in Dallas gone. American Airlines from Chicago is no longer in the system. American Airlines Madam second President. Miami flight is gone. American Airlines Senator out Shah. of JFK is gone. Madam President, on a point of order, the, see a point of order. the gentle... The member is misleading the House, Madam President. Madam President, the flight from Dallas to St. Lucia has been a seasonal flight, even under his government. I know what I'm talking about because I make frequent visits to Dallas in particular. There's a direct flight on American Airlines, Madam President, and my um, the member, the parliamentary secretary for the Ministry of Tourism, I'm sure has the information even better than I do, but I travel frequently enough, Madam President, to know that the direct flight on American Airlines from Dallas to St. Lucia was seasonal, so was the direct flight from New York to St. Lucia on American Airlines. So please do not mislead the House, Honorable Member of the Senate. This is untrue, and you should retract that and speak to the people of St. Lucia with the truth. Do not make it seem Senator. as if under this government, Elif has been reduced when you know very well that it was seasonal flights and these flights stop at a particular time. Thank you very much, Madam President. The member from the Parliamentary Secretary for in the Ministry of Tourism will give can give the numbers on numbers. LF. But what he's saying, Madam President, is untrue. All the hotels are full. Even Sen under him. Senator Fede, Senator Jean has indicated that the information presented by you is untrue. Um, as it pertains to the flights. Um, I wish you to comment. If not, you may have to retract that information. She has indicated that the flights were seasonal flights and hence the reason for the drop. What say you, Senator? Madam President, the Senator is correct in saying that the flights are seasonal, but the trouble is, is that they have stopped in the winter. 
airlines who operate seasonally fly in the winter and then they disappear in the summer. In well, the well, middle Senator, of winter, Senator, they're gone. Senator, they, they were not Senator there Fede. Senator Fede. Yeah. So do you wish? So, Madam President, Senator Fede. Yes. It is not year. Please conduct yourself in an appropriate manner. It is not year. I called you Senator Fede. Could you switch off your light and have a seat so I can speak to you? Thank you. If you do submit that what uh, Senator Jean indicated, that the flights were seasonal, would you be so kind as to indicate that for the record and can proceed with your, with your presentation? Can you repeat that, Madam President? If you do agree, which I, I sense that you are agreeing that the flights were seasonal, would you indicate that the flights were seasonal and then proceed with your explanation as you were going on previously? Madam President, I do not agree. Okay, so what I'm- You, you just indicated that can the I, flights were seasonal. Can I, can I indicate to you why I do not agree? Seasonal flights come in the winter the winter season in tourism goes from November to to April okay what I'm saying to you is that the American flights out of Dallas were in the winter they are not in the winter the high season of tourism you do not have those flights and so I cannot I cannot redraw the truth it's very simple I'm gonna put on the record and madam president you can take me to the privileges committee if I'm lying, okay? But I want to place on the record now that the senator does not know what she's talking about. Now, I'm, I'm placing what, on the what record. What are you placing on the record, Senator I'm Fede? placing on the record now. American Airlines from Chicago is not in the system for the winter. American Airlines from Dallas was not in the system for this winter. American Airlines to JFK is not in the system for this winter. JetBlue out of New Jersey is not in the system for this winter. And finally, finally, which is appalling, is the second American Airlines flight out of Miami. We've had two and we've lost one out of Miami. And I'm going to go further to place on the record that the equipment they use is a Boeing 737. And the range of the seats is from 160 to 175. So what I would like you to do, Madam President, is do the math. Come, you multiply five carriers by 165 average seats and see how many seats we have lost. You know why they don't know? Nobody is paying attention. Nobody is keeping their eye on the ball. We have the, the, the uh, parliamentary secretary in the Ministry of Tourism. He can stand up and he can check the facts and come. Okay, Senator, and, and, and Senator, you have placed on record. You have placed on record. This will be checked. It further needs to be clarified further after information is provided. So I advise you to move on with your presentation. I, I am moving on with my presentation. Okay, you have and 15 stand, minutes to complete your and presentation. I stand by the point. So, I so, show, you know, Madam President, I understand that it hurts the people on the government side when we come and we speak the truth about matters of importance in this country we went ahead we brought those flights to St. Lucia and we have lost them we have lost those flights we, we have lost them we have been unable to sustain them we have squandered the great opportunity that we had to continue in recovering our economy from COVID-19 response. And so I await to see the first tourism report of the year because we haven't, I haven't seen one for January. And I don't know if the, the parliamentary secretary has seen one, but I am waiting to see what that does. Because you know, another argument that have been made about the economic response to COVID is the fact that the, the economic response suggests that St. Lucia had the slowest and economy during COVID. It's a, it's a claim that they have argued. 
and why I am impressing that it becomes imperative for us to get the tourism aspect right is because we are the most tourism dependent economy in the OECS. And so because of that, because of that, because COVID has had the most debilitating impact on the travel and tourism industry, and it has affected travel and tourism more than any other sector, it is only natural that a tourism dependent economy or tourism dependent economies worldwide are going to then feel the brunt of the economic decimation caused by COVID. So there's no surprise that we would have lost 24% of our economic uh, output from COVID. There's no surprise that we would have lost 20% of our tax revenue at that time. There's no surprise that we would lose 15,000 jobs within the hotel sector and, and hundreds more in other sectors that depend on the tourism sector as the bedrock of the economy. There's no surprise that those things would happen. So what is required though now is a skillful management of the economy so that we would be in a better position to be able to fund a lot of the health needs that we need for the back end or the tail end of COVID-19. So we're borrowing 27 million today for the health resilience. I commend that. I commend the spirit of that. Um, we're borrowing 27 million for equipment. I commend the spirit of that because I, I do, I, I, there's a reason why I went through the long history to tell you, Madam President, how much equipment we had to get to ensure that we respond to this virus and this pandemic in a manner that that was adequate to save our population from its debilitating effects. There is need for infrastructure. Victoria Hospital alone cost us millions. We got a loan from the World Bank um, to overhaul Victoria Hospital, repainted it, uh, uh, had a lot of work to do on the inside to bring that up to standard, to make it an acceptable respiratory hospital so that the nation can respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, one of the disadvantages we would have now, now that the tourism sector is open, if we were to be struck with a pandemic, what are we going to use for quarantine facilities? And this is one of the things that this government may have to consider, that if we're not going to shut down the economy again and learning what we have learned from the management of COVID now, and learning what we have learned from the setting up of the protocols, maybe we might be able to coexist with COVID a lot better than we have in the past. And maybe there might not be a need for us to shut down the economy. And if we don't, and we keep our hotel sector open, then what do we use for quarantine facilities? Which is a major, major, major uh, asset in the response to the virus. Where do you put them? You can't put people to quarantine in the respiratory hospital where you've got positive patients or patients that are in a very critical condition um, who are almost at death. You can't put them in the respiratory hospital. So, so that is a big question that we need to answer. In, if we're going to consider responding to pandemics in the future, as this bill, motion rather, is focusing on borrowing for infrastructure, among other um, aspects or components for the health needs. So, Madam President, I understand very well, in closing, I would like to say, what the government is going through. I understand very well because we have been through it. And this is what we have done to help the people of St. Lucia, to save them from, could have been worse. I mean, many people died, unfortunately. And it affected people with underlying conditions, mostly the elderly um, and individuals with underlying conditions are no longer with us. And, and those people suffered the unfortunate fate of of, 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 of dying from COVID-19. We want to reduce that as much as possible. One person 
is too many dying from COVID. And so we have some questions as the government respond, um, because, and as you build health resilience, those are questions that we have as you, the administration in, at the helm of, of governing the country, grapple with the challenges moving ahead. I want to thank you, Madam President, for your time. Senator Shah. Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, I want to refocus on the resolution that is before us. And it is captioned, Resolution of Parliament to Borrow for Capital and Current Expenditure, Building Public Health Resilience, Coronavirus 2019 Response Project. And Madam President, the leader of government business in his eluc elucidation of the bill, of the resolution, sorry, indicated the various components that are within that bill. It is very ironic, Madam President, that some people do not want to hear about history on some occasions, mm -hmm. but want to bring back history on other occasions. So when it is convenient, history is important. When it's, you have to, they have to beat their chest, we have to sit down and listen to the history. But when all of what was done before, which inflicted pain on the people of St. Lucia, then that history should not come up and should not be discussed. Madam President, this bill is not only about COVID. And we need to stop thinking that COVID is the only health issue that we have in St. Lucia. Yes, we were exposed to the COVID virus like every single country in the world because based on the information that we got, the only country that we never got figures, COVID figures for was North Korea. Everywhere else we were able to trace the trend of COVID. And so St. Lucia, like everywhere else in the world, had COVID. But this bill, this resolution is not only about COVID. But Madam President, before I go into some of the components of the bill, I just want to read a small excerpt from an article by Culture Map Dallas, which is captioned, American Airlines romances DFW with new non-stop flights to tropical honeymoon paradise. And there is a section in the article which says, and I quote, the summer of 2021, we know what period the summer is. The summer of 2021 is an important moment for tourism as consumers return to safe travel experiences and our island continues to coexist with COVID, says St. Lucia Tourism Minister, Honorable Dominic Fede, in the release. Unquote. Madam President, I don't intend to belabor a point when some people are trying to shift you said winter. Shift you said summer points winter. and shift things to justify, you know, certain actions and, and where we are. Whether it was summer or winter, when we're comparing, Madam we President, must, I said certain people, Madam President, in the house. Senator Fee. Madam name. President, I never Order. responded. I never Member mentioned the member's name. Senator, stop. Senator Fede, you put your light on. I'm acknowledging you. Now you may speak. Could you address the chair, please? Yes. Madam President, on a point of order, 
What is a your point of order, is please? Leading the House. American Airlines, in addition to those that we have lost, they have year-round service. The Miami flight flies year-round. It's not seasonal. So which gateway are you talking about? Dallas American, Dallas, American Dallas, flies Dallas. from Dallas, from Boston. It flies from, it, it comes from Charlotte. Senator Fede. It goes a lot of different Senator places. Fede, yes. Senator Jean read an article. You're questioning the details of the article. You said she's misleading the house. What exactly did she say to mislead because, the because house? Because she's quoting me in the article to suggest that I am talking about the summer, but in my, in my submission to the house, I did say that seasonal flights are usually winter flights. Okay? So that's what I said. I said seasonal flights are usually winter flights. Senator so, Fede, Senator yes. Fede. Yes. The senator quoted an article and she left it right there. Let us move on. Move on, right. Senator. Thank you very much, Madam yeah. Madam President. Madam President, while we are hearing the beating of chest of all that was done during COVID by the last administration. Madam President, I want to remind this house and the people of St. Lucia that during that same COVID period, the people of St. Lucia had to endure beatings by COVID wardens for putting a mask, wearing a mask below their nose. Some of them were sitting in the market having breakfast and beaten up for not wearing masks. So if we want to go to history, history, we have to give all of the history of COVID. Madam President, during the COVID period, they used that excuse to barricade all outside of there. Nobody could have sat in Constitution Park to listen to what was happening on their behalf in this honorable house during covid madam president people's tomatoes were confiscated vendors produce were taken away from them there was a gentleman selling popcorn in constitution park his popcorn machine was confiscated and he was told that you were biting the hand that feed you get out of there so when we're looking at COVID and we want to beat our chest, we did this, that, that, air leave, blah, 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 blah. We have to give the whole picture. This morning we spoke about the bigger picture. We need to produce the bigger picture. When we talk in COVID, we have to talk everything. During COVID, ma Madam President, the tourism minister was head of the command center. COVID was a tourism problem more than it was a health problem for the people of St. Lucia, Madam President. That is what we got out of COVID during this time. But you know what? The success of our handling of COVID really was measured on July 26, 2021. That was the barometer of the success or failure of the management of COVID. Because at that time, it was more about how people felt. People's rights were violated. People were prevented from demonstrating their constitutional right. People were, 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 were arrested all the way in Kazaba. We forgot. We forgot when people were told, when, when police the police officers were told, arrest people in red. That was under COVID too, you know. So COVID was the excuse for every single thing. When St. Lucians wanted to demonstrate their democracy, and they were taking their vehicles and having a peaceful drive around the island, they were arrested all in the name of COVID. Mm -hmm. We must never forget that time. We must never forget. So I am happy to hear the history of COVID and all the splendid things that were done by the, the last administration. But I am also remembering all of the suppression of our democracy 
our freedom and our rights as enshrined in the Constitution, all of that was trampled upon during COVID under the name of COVID. So just like they say in the name of something, in the name of COVID, all of that happened. We must never forget it, Madam President. Madam President, I just want to go back to the focus of this bill and to show that this resolution to borrow the sum of $9.8 million, I think it is, is also to deal with a chronic problem that we have in our healthcare system, and that is dealing with non-communicable diseases. Madam President, I recalled under the administration of the then Honorable Kenny Anthony, free medication was given to diabetics and hypertension, hypertension patients. What happened to that? That was a demonstration of putting people first. That was taken away. Madam President, this borrowing will be for procurement of medical and non-medical equipment. This morning we hear a cry about an x-ray machine in St. Jude. That resolution is going to take care of that. The resolution is also going to deal with capacity building for the staff. We're talking about the big picture. All of these are going to be handled within that bill. Procurement of non-medical supplies, filing cabinets, refrigerators. I understand and we all understand that we're going back to COVID, but the vaccines that are being purchased must be refrigerated. And so refrigerators are being purchased for that. Holistic approach, bigger picture. Furniture for Comfort Bay. Central Warehouse, Larissus Wellness Center. $325,000 was estimated to repair a health center that was burnt. And no regard was paid to that facility by the last administration. We're talking about COVID, so Larissus got any COVID. The people in Larissus had no COVID. A health center was left there, ready to just disintegrate. Her huh? Her neighbors. Oh, her neighbors? <laughs> Maybe Larissus didn't have COVID because all of what was done for COVID under the last administration did not include the Larissus Health Center. $325,000 in the scheme of infrastructural development, just like we did, we said for the 3.5 for St. Jude. It's a drop in the ocean to fix a health center in a community. Huh? To fix a health center in a community, people who are hopefuls need to pay attention to these things because these little things matter. People are not going to just jump on a bandwagon and say, well, I will support you. But if you're not taking care of my interests, what will, what will they do? So these are some of the things that this resolution is seeking to cure. Madam President, during that time, we heard that loans were taken, the IMF was providing loans and support and we heard that St. Lucia took loans. But you know what else we heard? Oh, the IMF says spend the money, spend the money, spend the money on roads. Build roads, 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 spend the money, spend the money. Right? So we're talking now about income support and so on. But the largest share of the borrowings of COVID went into FFF. Friends, family, and the people who don't belong here. Madam President, um, I stand in a point of order. What is your point of order, Senator? Um, Madam President, the member continues to mislead the House in a very ridiculous manner to the FFF assertion, and I have to take it personal because I was part of the previous administration, 
to, and I know what it means, friends and family and, and foreigners, okay? That's ridiculous. That has no place here. Madam President, that ought to be redrawn. I understand on the market steps, you can say whatever you want, but this is the House of Assembly. Show some decorum. With that, that's, that's low and cheap. The, the road project was a loan that we have had when we came into government. We put on the excise tax, which was... Our Senator, road program, Senator Fady. which was Senator Fady. I'm explaining. Senator Fady. She's saying we borrowed money from the IMF for roads. We did not. Senator. Yes. Right. I have done it once and I've done it twice. When the chair calls upon you, Senator, you be quiet. Sure. No you problem. pay attention. Senator Jean indicated that the majority of the IMF loans were spent on roads. That is her assertion. You are saying she's misleading the House. Yes. And you're going on to do what exactly? You have made the point. I am going... You are explaining, you have made the point that she's so, misleading so the I'm House. And I'm, I'm showing why it's an untruth. Because very early on when we came into the administration, we put on the gas tax, and the gas tax, the excise tax, raised $30 million on an annual basis, and that's what we put into our road programs. We borrowed monies from the Taiwanese. The rapid response facility, which the IMF had for, for developing countries and for countries to respond to COVID, actually went to the COVID response. It went to all the great things I said, uh, refitting Victoria Hospital into uh, a respiratory facility, Senator making sure that we got the ventilators, building health capacity. Senator Fede. That is an untruth. Senator Fede. Yes, you had two segments. Your first was that uh, the use of the FFF yes. was improper and you asked to show proper decorum which was nothing to do with uh, misleading the house and then secondly you have provided some explanation. I will ask Senator Jean to proceed with her presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much Madam Chair. Some little things hurt. <laughs> yep. Yep. Stings. Some little things hurt. Madam President, I'm reminded, I'm reminded of the saying, what's the point of saving lives without livelihoods? I'm reminded of that. And uh, Madam President, I will not go in and itemize the amount of borrowing, amount of spending during COVID that took place unnecessarily or on things that were unrelated to COVID because the member has the history, the member will use the history. But I just want to point out to the member that history, you cannot take one part of history and set aside the other part. I'm giving you the full history. Who feels it knows it, partner? Madam President, who feels it knows it? Madam President, who feels it knows it? And the people of St. Lucia felt it on the 26th of July. And they did what they had to do. So Madam President, when we are talking on behalf of the people of St. Lucia, we want them to know that what is being done is in the best interest, is in their best interest. And in the healthcare, in, 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 as it relates to healthcare, the government of St. Lucia, under the sterling leadership of Honorable Philip JPA, has the ultimate interest first. We have to see that through these bills, you're not going to see squandering of vaccine money and vaccines carry hair. We're not going to see. We're not going to see advance payments given for full amounts and nothing happening. The requisite accountability. And Madam President, I spent over 30 years in the public service. My time in the, in the public service 
transcended both administrations. I worked with the administration up to John Compton, with Mr. with Honorable Vaughn Lewis, with Honorable Dr. Kenny Anthony, with Honorable Stevenson King, and with Honorable Alan Chastney. Unfortunately, I am not part of the public service under the leadership of Honorable Philip J. Pierre. But I could tell you, Madam President, there is a vast difference in what I saw during the period 2016 to 2021. Levels of accountability went down the drain. And right now, this current administration has a lot of repairing to do to ensure that the laws that we come here to make are upheld. Because what passed, Madam President, we saw it blatantly, our very highest law of the land, our constitution, said that there shall be a deputy speaker and we didn't have one. Our very top law of the land. Mm? So why we come here to make laws, Madam President? Why are we here to make laws that are not going to be upheld? That people can just decide whether they want to uphold the law or not? The system of lawlessness that took place over the last 2016 to 2021, I don't want to say over the last five years, because the last five years will include the 18 months of this administration. We have to make it distinctly clear that from 2016, June 6, 2016, to July 26, 2021, the system of lawlessness that pervaded our country should never ever happen again. The people of St. Lucia must ensure that they are responsible enough when they choose people to represent them that these people can come forward and do what is right for our country. Madam President, I am told that on that same July of 2021, a little again the civil servants would not have gotten paid. You're telling me you're going to blame it on COVID? Tutba, I say COVID? Huh? COVID, they were preparing Rat Island for us, Madam President, to serve as a quarantine facility. That's the history of COVID. That was the first suggestion for a quarantine facility, Rat Island. Huh? Come see the say, Mouton, you take a Menela. That's how we were treated. So, Madam President, the bill, the resolution, <coughs> to borrow the sum of 9.867 million, which is going to respond to our health care, part of which will go to COVID, part of which will go to helping the people who are anti-vaxxers to understand the importance of taking the vaccine. Because we're seeing the successes of the vaccine so far. Now that we're seeing a reduction in COVID cases, there must be in some part some attribution to the COVID vaccine. And so public education is, is important. And I trust that the health officials, the health practitioners, will do all in their power to see how they can provide the quality service that is required to the people of St. Lucia. Going back to what was said by Senator Polius this morning, health is wealth. A healthy nation is a wealthy nation. I want to commend the health practitioners, all those who really braved this COVID pandemic, the, the fire officials, the ambulance facility, facility operators, and all of the others who were in the forefront of that fight to COVID, towards COVID. We saw the positive, but we also saw the negative that we must never forget and never repeat. Thank you very much, Madam President. Senator Porius.
Madam President, I really don't wish to offer any kind of rebuttal to some of the comments that have been, or some of the arguments that have been advanced. Because there is so much that can be said, so much. But because I know and I have articulated it in this chamber that we should not play games, no political games with the health of our people, I will just proceed with my submission. Madam President, I want to assume that we are all aware that the provision of better quality and affordable health care requires a comprehensive and inclusive approach. One that goes beyond just the infrastructure, although it is very important because that's the first thing you need to consider and to ensure that is in place. But we want to go beyond that to include one, sufficient supply of well-trained and competent staff to respond to the diverse health needs of our people. Secondly, the necessary tools, equipment, and resources for delivering quality health care services. Three, social support programs and I must admit that the leader of government business has mentioned some of these in his presentation. So those programs that can not only address resilience, those programs that seek to improve the quality of health for our people, particularly education, transportation, he mentioned, but to and from health services or facilities, sorry. There are many of our people, Madam President, who suffer from chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, kidney failure, those who find it very difficult to obtain the necessary uh, resources to purchase the medication. And I'm happy to hear that access will be provided and will continue to be provided so that these people can afford, they will be able to obtain the medication. So I'm really, really happy to hear that. But just to correct the senator who went right before me, the senator would be pleased to know that during the COVID pandemic, or at the time when we experience the worst of the pandemic, while it is true that the health center or the, the health, that Larissa's health and wellness center was not renovated, no monies were spent on it. However, the Rich for Health Center was retrofitted to respond to the increasing demands. The Rich for Health Center, and I'm going to say it again, was retrofitted to respond to those demands. Notwithstanding, Madam President, it would be remiss of me not to lend and to acknowledge some support to this motion. I lend my support to this motion because I know that my mother in particular, who's diabetic, she's hypertensive too, and the many other um, people in Orléans, Dede Rivière, Gadette, Larissus, 
all of these people will be happy. They will be relieved, knowing very well that very soon a health center, which some of them have been calling for for several years, they will be able to have it. And I am hoping, I am hoping, it's not just about putting people first. It's not about that. There are many, if we have to think about putting people first, I think what you really want to say is protecting your victory. I think that is what you want to say, protecting your victory. So, Madam President, despite this, I want to support the borrowing. I want to support the motion. But I also want to add, Madam President, that we're not going backwards. We're going forward. We're moving forward. And I would like to believe that these health care facilities, one that was mentioned is the Larissus Health and Wellness Center, these facilities that will be refurbished, renovated, or retrofitted will satisfy the key components of a good quality of good quality health care. Particularly with relevant support programs that will not only build resilience, but will focus on changing mindsets. That will focus on educating our people, particularly the young ones. That will focus on creating community health awareness, all in an effort to prevent and to reduce the risk of chronic health problems that our people face today. Madam President, I also would love to see in the school curriculum a more explicit thrust on disease prevention. I would love to see a clearer focus on school-related activities to change lifestyles, activities that will help to improve the well-being and the overall mental health of our primary school students, our secondary school students. These are the leaders of tomorrow. And so I'm hoping and I'm looking forward to those kinds of programs, not just a facility, but we want to be able to see the support programs that will accompany such project so that we can continue to change mindsets. We can continue to impress upon our young people because even if we produce or we provide them with this fancy facility and they still go on living the very same way, they do not change their lifestyles, Madam President, this would mean nothing. So I look forward to this and I know that my mother and even myself because you know every every week every week it's either myself my brother my sister we have to take her to the Richmond Health Center at least twice for the week twice for the week and I know that many other um, people in in Gadet and the environs will be happy that you know very soon they will be able to go and enjoy the comfort of the Larissus Wellness and Health Center. I thank you. This is not to blow your trumpet, huh? You just you just beat the blow. Yes. Thank you, Madam President. I'm sorry. Senator to serve. Madam President, mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> come, come, come.
Welcome. Everybody, you right. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, it was not my intention to make any submission on the motion before us. But in the course of the deliberation thus far, I find it very fitting to add just a few, stick a few, a few um, pins, Madam President. And I want to start off with this quote by Robert Half, and it says, not admitting a mistake is a bigger mistake. And so I'm not sure if perhaps the senator, leader of opposition business, in his delivery was in fact, in his own way, making an attempt to admit a mistake. And the reason I say that, Madam President, is because whereas the motion before us is a motion to allow for the Minister of Finance to borrow some, to borrow monies from the Caribbean Development Bank for the implementation of the Building Public Health Resilience Coronavirus Disease 2019 Response Project. Perhaps I, I was not attentive enough, but I could not have pinpointed, Madam President, in his deliberation, any focused arguments about the actual motion at hand. In fact, what we got is a flip of what was said opposite this morning. When I, in, a, in looking at the previous, the previous motion before us on St. Jude's, responded to Senator Stanislaus on some of the issues that had over the years presented itself at, itself at St. Jude's Hospital, I got reprimanded by, by, by Member Fede that I had gone down the line of history. He, sat, he stood right over there, Madam President, and he said, I'm going to participate in the VA, and I'm going to do all these things, and I'm going to take a look at the VA, and I'm going to do all these things, and I'm going to do all these things, and I'm going to ask these questions. But I sat here now, and heard him speak everything that would have suggested that he made particular contributions in, in the effort of the fight against coronavirus, but no specific um, items or, or indication with reference to this motion for borrowing. And so, like I, like I said, I am wondering whether it was his own segue of an apology to the people of St. Lucia with the things that were done with the monies that were borrowed during his tenure for the people of St. Lucia for the improvement of health care in this country during that period and for the, for the coronavirus and, and the debilitating effects it had on our economy. Madam, Madam President, there was also a Senator um, Senator Jean stood on a point of order when Senator Fede made a comment again down his history line on the tourism arrivals and he stood up and attempted to refute it. But Madam President, if we look at the, the, the arrival figures as at December 2022, whereas, whereas the, the, the Senator alluded to the fact that many flights were discontinued. It begged the question as to, perhaps the flights have been discontinued for true, I'm not going to argue either here or there on that, but have, did we attempt to assess what the actual effects in figures are? Because is there a direct correlation or can we ascertain rather that there is a direct correlation between the reduction of the flights and the arrivals? Because I think what's important, Madam President, is the arrivals. Sanu ni puga de sinuka tinuka kapali about whether or not tourism industry a kote nouvle ye be SEP me pe la ne passe. We flights ka to e kamene muna to e. But SEC yon de flights do boot. SEC sakika still vinia still many moon and then limo nukai sadi ki pli me pe lane ava and if we look at me madam president i'm looking at the figures here tourism stay over arrivals by month 
and we look at 2022 and in the month of January 2022 the figure was 21,864 as compared to 2021 which was 6,357 does that not suggest Madam President that there was an increase in the numbers of course it was not as high as the 2019 pre-COVID figures of 34,546 but it shows an increase and Madam President it is very sad that I have to stand here today and I keep hearing the leader of government business time and again in this honorable house lamenting lamenting about the fact that at every juncture when somebody stands upon their feet to comment to refute to seek clarification on a point that the leader of opposition business has made he is never in his seat yes. madam president why is it that he cannot remain in the honorable house yes, to please. see about the business of the people that he was appointed to yes. why is it that he... <laughs> madam president it is really something it, it is a pattern a pattern that is very concerning yes. to me i'm not sure if it's concerning to other people but it's definitely concerning to me i understand we have to go out every now and then i go out every now and then perhaps to use the washroom or because of the cold to get some heat but maybe there is some additional intervention that needs to be made because it's probably an a, an, an issue that we don't understand and i i think for the <laughs> i think for the that yeah we, we need to look into it senator senator polius i agree it's a little too much it, it has become yeah it, was, it has become out of hand um if we look at for example december in 2022 38,829 as compared to 29,737 in 2021 if we pick September, 19,527 as compared to 14,896 in 2021. And so, Madam President, you know, he stood there, like I said, and he refuted these figures. Cruise ship, cruise ship arrivals by month, January 2022, 32,937 arrivals as compared to zero in 2021. 40,447 the months of january february march april and may in 2021 recorded zero so but you have figures in 2022 that speaks to an increase and an improvement and so as as the member usually does in his usual manner he always attempts to mislead the honorable house and the people of saint lucia and he has not realized madam president that these tactics do not work on saint lucians because saint lucians are smarter than that and they spoke at the polls in 2021 and and the member does not seem to understand that this has happened but madam president in lending my support to the motion i want to recognize some of the points and i have ended this segment of my presentation and then the member walks in um, it's unfortunate that I can't play the replay button, press the replay button for him. Um, Madam President, I, just a, a, a few more points in that regard. I am, I am very happy that the Senator opposite, Senator Polius, understands a little better than the, the leader of, of, of opposition business that the improvements to be made in the healthcare sector are improvements that are much needed improvements and i don't wish to to stay too long on the matter of the larry shoes reach for health center conversation but i'm happy that she pointed out that a government who campaigned and formed the majority government on the mantra of putting people first that she on the other side has recognized that it is not about some of the people it is about all of the people and so there is no there is no element of discrimination or, or, or that sort of thing there because she rightly pointed out that her own family members and she 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 pinpointed specifically her mother will see benefits from the particular health center ensuring that it's up and running and i i i would have liked i would have I would have been even more elated 
if she perhaps had made a strong case for her mother a couple years ago so that she would not have had the, 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 the trouble of having to transport her to the Rich for Health Center. But again, it is really showing that this is a government who continues to put people, people, no, no two ways about the people first. I noted, Madam President, that um, Senator Polius made a suggestion, a welcome suggestion, in terms of that the, that the facility does not just become another building facility doing the same basic things that health facilities have been doing. Um, and I am pretty sure Senator Polius knows, but perhaps I will take the opportunity to remind her and the, the viewing and listening public that the first of this government as it comes to healthcare has been in the public for. And when it comes to ensuring that the healthcare services work for us, we've been seeing the efforts of the Ministry of Health in doing just that. So for example, the Mikud Health Center has been designated under this administration as the center of excellence for chronic diseases, and I don't remember what is the other one. And so I think it, it speaks to the suggestion that she made that there has been headway in that regard because there are health he, wellness centers that are being that are being designated looking at specific streamlined health issues. And I know in a conversation, I do not remember what it was a conversation in this honorable house, where the question was asked, and I, I think it was the, 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 um, the leader of the opposition who brought up that point in the house in terms of he was he was asking or, or suggesting rather that when the centers of excellence were designated that the particular health centers is that only what it would do and i, I find it was <laughs> yeah i i got that in in my whilst i was listening i got that and i think it was a bit cheap as, as, as the, 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 um, the senator indicated, because we know how the health centers operate, and even though there is a specific focus at particular wellness centers on specific health issues, but the, health, the wellness centers continue to operate to do every basic thing that they continue to do. We've also seen, for example, recently we saw the launch of St. Lucia Moves, which we've recognized that Having our people moving a little more will help in addressing some of these very chronic diseases and so on. And so we have seen, I saw a video, was it last week, with on the Honorable Member for Soufre Forseja moving with, with, with doing her, her aerobics and so on. And so it, it speaks, Madam President, to the fact that to the fact that there are delib there is deliberate effort within the ministry to ensure that we're not just putting buildings, but that the, but that there are streamlined and strategic that there are streamlined and st strategic activities and initiatives to ensure <laughs> that the resources that we're placing on the ground are actually working towards um, addressing the health needs of our nation. And so, like I indicated, I, I like the fact that she mentioned that, but only to say that I, I think she's, um, that um, it, is, it is, how would I say it? As, as well as as much as the suggestion is welcome but it is something that is already happening and just in case the member was not away i wanted to point it out and so like i i indicated when we looked at the previous motion to borrow for healthcare facilities i want to reiterate that any effort of a government to ensure that the health of its people is of top priority for it is a motion that i will stand in this honorable house and um and and support madam president because the health of our nation is very important and if we don't have healthy persons and persons that are just dropping and falling then what is the purpose of everything else that we do who, we, who are we doing it for and so um like we like was indicated prior um, almost every time we have come to this honorable house with regards to borrowing it has been something related to the health the health um, sector and so it says one that there are a lot of issues that currently exist in healthcare 
but it says as well that this government is taking deliberate steps to ensure that we improve on our healthcare facilities, improve on the services they provide, and more than anything else, to build resilience within the health sector to ensure that we continue to meet the growing needs, the growing demands of our people, as well as to cushion ourselves for the unexpected. And so I support the motion before us, Madam President. Senator Daniel. Thank you very much, um, Madam President. Madam President, I think we all recognize and subscribe to the principle that government is continuous. Many of us, we pay lip service to the principle of the continuity of government, but just as often we demonstrate anything but a commitment to that principle of the continuity of government. Those who hold the reins or man the helm of government may change a different party for the mechanism of elections and the attainment of a majority in parliament. They be the one entitled by constitution and all laws subservient to form the government. But once you are there, you have to take responsibility for what your predecessors, once they lawfully entered into any agreement or any contract, you have to honor it, especially the financial contracts and arrangements once they are there. And nothing you can say that this government, they took this loan or they floated these bonds or they went into this obligation that is misguided, is foolish, so we don't like it, so we're not going to honor it. You do that and you're dead in the water. I mean, your credit rating is going to crater. It's going to crash and burn. You'll be unable to raise loans when you have that kind of bad history to you. So sometimes even when you have all kinds of misgivings, whether it is about range, whether it is about the box at St. Jude's, whether it is about Dye Mall, once it has been solemnly and properly entered into, you've got to honor it. Now, I did listen to one of the members opposite this morning. And I think it was the leader of opposition business criticizing the government and admonishing the government that they need to get off what he considers to be, he didn't use the word rant, but always shellacking and recriminating against the former government. And he admonished us almost like a composed and accomplished lecturer that we need to accept that we are in government and that we are responsible and stop all this blaming and all this hitting out at the predecessor. I think his words were that you are in government now, you are responsible, you made certain promises, the people believed you, and it is for our allegedly not doing those things that they voted us out. I couldn't agree with him more, but almost in the same breath, he proceeds to engage in a relitigating of issues of his own, mainly to show how wonderfully he and the government of which he was part of were performing. And to talk about all the great things that they do, some of which to me went off topic, right. about airlines and flights and how well we were doing with flights and those things. But let's say they are acceptable references. But he went into a relitigation of things upon which the grand jury of the nation state of St. Lucia, a.k.a. the people, the electorate, have spoken overwhelmingly, decisively, unmistakably, as they did in July 2021. And I do not know whether it is deliberate or inadvertent, but I think the distraction of this may have even worn upon us because I see a tendency for us to feel that we have to respond and to go down the way where the conversation almost became about the flights and the numbers and the passengers and the airlift when in fact what is before us to the best of even this novice rookie newcomer but for the fact that I have an instrument of appointment I might have considered that I am an interloper but I think what is before us is a motion to authorize the Minister of Finance to borrow 9,867,000 US dollars 
from the ordinary capital resources of the Caribbean Development Bank, allocated from the European Investment Bank Second Climate Action Line of Credit Component Resources, the loan for the implementation of the Building Public Health Resilience Coronavirus Disease 2019 Response Project. And if we have strayed from this focus, I hope by my minuscule contribution that I can nudge us back into the focus on this. There is no discussion about airlift and, and, and about whether the numbers then were there and whether we were doing better then than that and, and, and this sort of thing. It's so easy for us to lose focus. Many things evolve and the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic was one which evolved. There does not seem to be an understanding that when this thing came, Many times we were shooting and punching in the dark. We didn't know what we were pushing, what we were punching and pushing at. It was something new. We didn't understand what it was. The whole thing about vaccines, they were not there yet. We had to wait for them to develop. And yes, maybe some of them were actually rushed and so on. We had not come to the point of the learning curve about COVID then as we have done now. The fact that we have come to a better understanding of COVID, the fact that many more people have been vaccinated, although in the case of our country, the number is still woefully unacceptably low, but it is what it is, I'll use that phrase again. People have become vaccinated, have acquired immunity. Some have acquired what they call natural immunity. We now better understand the variants that we deal with of the coronavirus are not as deadly, at least not immediately, as they were with the Delta variant. The Omicron is still around. COVID is still around. And we need to hear that people are still dying of COVID. People are still getting COVID. But because of the combination, perhaps, of natural immunity, of vaccination, we are not hearing so many deaths being reported. And I believe as part of the relaxation of the measures, where we are no longer under obligation to wear masks and to maintain social distancing, and we are not hearing of the fatalities, there might be an assumption that COVID is over or it's nearly over. Such a declaration by the people who are competent to make it has not been made, and we must not assume it. But even more so, Madam President, even if, even if, the very what I would call acute side of COVID has subsided because of a less lethal variant, because of the many other factors that have mitigated us, the vaccinations, the acquired immunity, and our greater understanding and knowledge of it. We have to understand that sometimes the residual impact of a pandemic, of a hurricane, of an earthquake, of a volcanic eruption, do not manifest and are often not felt in the immediate phases of it. It is in the residual phases, the after, where you think you're at the tail end of it, that sometimes a lot of the really dreadful things about it are affecting you. We have to understand there is a possibility. I'm not in a position to talk about it, but a lot has been said about long COVID. How many people are struggling with health issues and crises of strokes, of heart attacks, of a whole lot of things that may be the result of organ damage that they suffered as a result of having had COVID infections, which our hospitals, which our healthcare system, and all those things need to continue to deal with. It is not only when we see people as we saw at the beginning of the pandemic before even the place where it started, China had not figured what it was about. And we saw those pictures, those videos of people standing at bus shelters, waiting for a bus after work and just, you know, tipping over, falling to the ground and not getting up again, just dying like that. We must never forget that. That horrifying stage may have passed. Although we need to ask ourselves a question because so many countries, including China, that you would expect would have been the furthest along the learning curve, the furthest along the COVID um, response, China, in the resurgence of COVID that we had was the country where it manifested most harshly and most plentifully. The mighty United States, the world's most advanced country in terms of research and medicine and, and, and development and technology and all those things. We saw the struggle that they had with COVID. 
We also saw President Biden coming out in October last year and whether misspeaking, as they tend to say, making the point that the pandemic was over. He was rounded upon and pounced upon by so many people, not just politicians in the scientific community, and doctors unanimously came out and said, the pandemic is not over. And we make that assumption to our peril if we do. Therefore, I want to suggest that even though Senator Fede is correct and that we are at the back end of the pandemic, I want to say we need to qualify that and say maybe we are at the low end of the pandemic where the acuteness of it is concerned, but we still suffer economically from the supply chain disruptions that COVID brought about. We are not back to the place and we are still in a place of vulnerability that we need to ensure that what exactly this resolution is about, building public health resilience. And I take the resilience to mean that we want to put ourselves in a place that should COVID come back roaring at us, a new variant is always possible, something as bad as Delta or maybe even worse that we have in place the systems and the structures and the responses, maybe the things at the time that we didn't quite grasp because we're not far along the learning curve of it, that we put those things into place. And so I am heartened that the opposition members, even if they criticize, although I have to say Senator Ampolius has been extremely mature Absolutely. on all occasions that I have seen her speak. She says a bit, she doesn't agree with everything. And I think Senator Fede, in principle and generally, I don't think he has expressed opposition to it. I believe his problem is, well, not his problem, I believe his focus is that he wants to say that maybe if this had been done, that we wouldn't need to borrow, or whatever it is. I'm not too sure what the point is, because what I'm hearing is we did better, or we did this, and we did right. But I have not heard a comprehensive argument as to why we ought not to need that authorization to borrow. Once again, your humble servant, green, inexperienced, spring chicken as he is, he understands an authorization to borrow to be just that, an, op an authorization. We want to put there to the Minister of Finance that he has the authority of the sovereign state of St. Lucia through its parliament to borrow so much money so that we can deal with what we call the Coronavirus Disease Response Project, building public health resilience. I do not see any basis for opposing this, for voting against it. Yes, we may criticize it, we may refine it. In fact, that is what the committee stage is for, that if there is anything in there that maybe needs, you know, putting a little comma in between. I've heard there are limitations basically on, on the Senate in terms of what it can do with things having to do with money, but that is under the, the expert hand of your guidance. But I want to say again, the people who continue to be sick and dying because of long COVID, much of it undiagnosed, much of it unrecognized, I would hope that part of the resilience that we build in is to recognize this, to deal with it, and to build in safeguards if ever we are faced with anything like that again. Madam President, with those few words, I want to thank you once again for your time and to indicate that my unreserved, wholehearted support is for this resolution in its present form. Thank you. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Madam President. Before I respond, I just want to remind or inform my colleague who has admitted is green that in the case of this motion there will be no committee stage because it's a money, it's a money um, bill as they say. It's, it, it's um, basically for a passage. not So there will be no need for committee stage on this one. But it's correct that um, our duty here is to give support to what is necessary and to authorize the Minister of Finance to do what he has to do. Um, and we trust that the public servants that are duly uh, um, appointed and duly hired to do the job of providing oversight and managing and administration of the funding and the spending will do just that. Uh, Madam President, thankfully for the first time in a long time, although the chair is still empty, but the, I, I don't know if there's a, a Pagwati in the chair, Madam President. <laughs> 
But at least this time, the leader of opposition business is in the chamber. So I'm very pleased that at least I am now able to respond and that he can hear me first hand. I will attempt to just briefly address a couple of concerns that he may have raised and a few, a few of the issues. First of all, Madam President, um, what I listen to generally in this um, debate is not that there seem to have been an opposition to this motion, which is happening. So we have recognized the need for us to um, get this, 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 these funds. But I saw an effort by the leader of opposition business to go down memory lane. I don't know if it was a way of comfort to himself, but to take us back down and try to um, create a chronicle or a series of achievements, quote unquote, by his then government. And of course, since there wasn't much to speak on health, he resorted to his area of comfort, which is tourism not remembering perhaps or not paying attention to the fact that the person on the other side is the parliamentary secretary in the Ministry of Tourism. And when he raised these issues on figures and all of those, all I had to do was just pick up my phone and look at the figures. Um, I resisted the temptation to stand and say anything. I allowed for him to have his way. Senator Jean challenged him. But I just sat there and I'm saying to myself, anyone with any good sense will know that if you're going to challenge issues on figures and statistics in any ministry department, and the minister or the parliamentary secretary of that ministry is in the chamber, they will have access, unless all the PSCs and all the, the, the technocrats are asleep and not doing their job, which is not the case in the Ministry of Tourism, I must say, and he would know that, he was there, that that person would have access to the data. So I am... <laughs> I don't understand why you would try to pull that fast one, Madam President, in, a, in, in, this, in this circumstance. But anyway, I have resisted the temptation. I'm not going to be dragged into it. I knew where he was going. When you have nothing to say on the motion, you have to find something to say, and you have to find something to say where you think you're comfortable. But not necessarily. And so sure. that motion really was dragged into a discussion about airlift, flight figures. Um, and I took a peep at the statistics while he was talking. Um, looked at the aircraft, <coughs> the aircraft um, movement figures from SLASPA, as well as the arrival figures from SLTA. And, as, and while he was talking, I'm just shaking my head because everything he's saying is a direct opposite, a direct contrast to what I was reading in front of me. And as I say, Madam President, I don't want to bring all these figures into the discussion now. But fortunately, I had the benefit of going back to look while he was making the presentation and was reminded by the figures that there's no need to go and get involved in that discussion because what he was saying can be um, dismissed with one statement. Despite all the discussion on airlift, and I can bring in a number of the names there, we talk about flights lost. If you look at the, 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 the various airlines, I just mentioned a few, um, JetBlue, American, WestJet, British Airways, Delta, Air Canada, Virgin Atlantic, all of them. And if you look at the routes, I'm not going to do the figures, just mention the routes, Madam President. New York, Charlotte, Miami, um, Atlanta, Toronto, London, Gatwick, London, Heathrow, Port of Spain, I even have a Caribbean destination. New Jersey, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago, and it goes on and on, Madam President. At a cursory glance, it is very clear outside of bringing up all the figures in this Senate, that the figures, the number of arrivals in this country as we speak, is overwhelmingly high, is unbelievably high. The occupancy, let me give you an example, Madam President, practical. I have a very close friend of mine who celebrated a birthday yesterday. And he called me and said, um, but buddy, you know I cannot, I'm trying to get a, a, a book a, a room to take my family for the weekend. So he's, he's asking me whether I could probably help him locate one of the hotels where he can find um, a room so that he can take his family out on the weekend. He couldn't find a room to, a, a hotel room to book in this country. Yesterday, Madam President, you think I'm going to come here and try and debate figures 
when the practical example on the ground is that all of our hotel rooms are full. And if that is a reality, there's no, you, you can test it, he can check, and I know he knows that. You can't get a room, <laughs> and, and we're having a discussion on healthcare, and you want to talk about rooms and bookings and so on. Madam President, I'm not going into that. I just want to make the one statement that right now St. Lucia is experiencing in almost every hotel uh, an occupancy rate above 90%, and that tells you what it means for the management of the industry that he was trying to hit. I know he likes to think, think of himself, Madam President, as a tourism guru like his leader did, but the, uh, Mr. Deputy, but the figures and the stats and the circumstances, um, they are very much alive. Now, uh, you say alive? yeah, the, the, the circumstances are very much alive. You could see them. Alive, yeah. Don't take a literal, don't take a literal um, um, in interpretation. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, a um, statement that I have placed on the record in this house, I stand on the point of order, the members just, just, misleading the house. Okay? Just stop. Hold a second. I haven't recognized anybody yet. So, sorry. Senator Fede, sorry. Yeah. Yes, you are. The member is misleading the house in Mis suggesting <laughs> that the, the statements which I made concerning the flights are a lie. Oh. Ah, alive. Oh, alive. Okay. Mr. All right. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> Mr. President, I didn't say alive. I will not use that word in this chamber. So um, let me paraphrase. Let me paraphrase. Evident. Okay, I excuse him. He thought I had said a lie. I didn't say that. But he knows that. And Madam President, the leader of opposition business know that I do not go down this. I don't do that. I don't use that kind of language in this Senate. I don't. We know. We know the tendencies that some of us have. It's not, that's not like for me to do. And so it's understood. He, miss, he didn't hear properly what I said. But um, they're, they're evident. So understood, understood calling. Um, but Mr. Deputy President, uh, let me just try to go back to what really was relevant to the, the debate. And as I made a, jotted a few points, I noted that um, the honorable member mentioned the issue of um, borrowing that amount today shows how bad things were at the time. I just want to ask him uh, if things were that bad at the time, um, why was there so much wastage mm. of what was borrowed? That's things were right. bad and you borrowed, but you wasted everything you borrowed. Um, but Madam President, we are not going to, Mr. Deputy, we are not going to waste. I wish he would at least, you see why he didn't hear what I was saying? He's not paying attention and he just, yeah, just jump at me. If, I can, if I can say to you, Mr. Deputy President, I will inform the, in, the opposition of the reasons we are not going to waste the amounts that we are borrowing. And Senator Polius, previous to her, Senator Stanislas also cautioned us about making sure that what we borrow is going to be used for the purpose. And on that particular note, I want to remind the Senate of why and what it is we're going to spend. We're going to be making sure that we finance, and as we mentioned in the previous bill, we're financing the various primary health care facilities and the operations. We're providing additional staff. That's one of the things I had not mentioned. Additional staff paying increases to, to our health care um, pro, um, providers who have not received them. Increases in their pay and their back pay. We are using this to purchase cardiac machines. I think the, um, Senator Polius mentioned chronic um, health issues with liver, not liver, but um, kidney. Um, we have issues with dialysis. These, that is what we're doing with these months. We are also um, stocking pharmaceuticals because we, I heard the mention of the need for those things with um, non-communicable diseases. diseases. Digitization, that's one of the issues I have not mentioned, Mr. Deputy, and I want to mention it now. The digitization um, to improve efficiency. When you go to these healthcare facilities, because everybody has to write everything, you have long lines, and everybody takes a whole hour to be able to access something you could have done in 10 minutes. Digitization is one of the ways that you can improve efficiency. We also have to take care of some of our outstanding debt to vendors, people that provide services that we owe. And I must say some of these services were not provided before 20, 
before July 26, 2021. But we still have to pay for them. So, Madam President, these are some of the reasons why we want this to justify and we should justify this borrowing. And finally, I just have um, a brief response for Senator Polius, who I believe today um, was on a totally different wavelength to her leader in terms of the way she addressed and approached this particular motion, um, being very, very, fair, very um, straight up about why she supported it. Um, and I do not need to re reiterate her, her own deliberation, but to say that I am just worried as to whether she may not find herself in some trouble with her leader um, when she shows that level of you know, support openly, even admitting the, the extent to which the Larish Self Center is going to serve the, 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 um, you know, the community well. Um, I'm hoping that she doesn't get herself into any trouble, considering the unopposed um, news that we've heard of lately. But I want to commend members for, for all of the, the contributions that they've made, and as was correctly said, for a level of maturity in the way that we approach this particular motion and look forward to the, the benefits of it to, to the people of Deriso, Larishus, um, Gadet, um, and every other part of this country where people really do need the services that these, um, these monies are going to help to bring to them. I thank you, Mr. Senators, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow $9,867,000 US dollars from the ordinary capital resources of the Caribbean Development Bank allocated from the European Investment Bank Second Climate Action Line of Credit Component Resources, the loan, for the implementation of the Building of Public Health Resilience Coronavirus Disease 2019 Response Project. Be it further resolved that A, the loan is repayable in 76 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments commencing three years after the date of the loan agreement. B, interest at the variable rate of 4.06% per annum is payable quarterly on the amount of the principal disbursed and outstanding from time to time. C, a commitment fee at a rate of 1% per annum is payable quarterly on the amount undisbursed from time to time, commencing from the 60th day after the date of the loan agreement. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I wish to present this resolution or this motion standing in my name. Whereas it is provided under section 65.01 um, for Public Finance Administration Cap 1501, the Act, that the Minister of Finance may, by affirmative resolution of Parliament, grant a guarantee in accordance with an enactment. And whereas it is further provided under section 69.2 of the Act that a guarantee issued by the government or on contingent liability created by the government in accordance with the reg regulations under the Act and in accordance with another enactment shall be charged and paid out of the consolidated fund. And whereas it is provided under Section 41 of the Millennium Heights Medical Complex Act, 6, Act Cap 1107, that with the approval of Parliament, sig sig signified by a resolution, the Minister of Finance may guarantee any approved borrowing by the medical complex. And whereas it is further provided under Section 42 of the Millennium Heights Medical Complex Act Cap 1107, that a borrowing guaranteed shall, in default of payment by the medical complex, be charged on the consolidated fund. And whereas the Minister of Finance considers it necessary to guarantee a line of credit from First National Bank St. Lucia Limited, the bank, to the Millennium Heights Medical Complex in the amount of 
$23 million and $50,000, consisting of A, an overdraft limit of Eastern Caribbean $6,500,000 to assist with working capital requirements. B, a loan of EC $5 million to assist with operational expenses for the purchase of new equipment. C, a loan of EC $11,400,000 to satisfy a debt of Ministry of Finance. And D, a corporate credit card with a limit of $150,000 Eastern Caribbean dollars to assist with monthly expenses. And whereas for the overdraft limit of 6,500,000 EC, A, a term of the overdraft is for 12 months, B, interest is payable at 6% per annum, subject to a change in line with the general level of interest rates, excess rate of 17%. And whereas for the loan of EC 5 million, A, the term of the loan is for 118 months, B, repayment is $36,985 monthly with effect from one month after drawdown with the last payment plus any outstanding principal and interest due 180 months after full drawdown, C, Interest is payable at a rate of 4% per annum, subject to a change in line with the general level of fluctuating rates. And whereas, for a loan of 11.4 million, that the A, the term of the loan is for 180 months, B, repayment for 84,324 dollars monthly with effect from one month after drawdown, with the last payment plus the outstanding principal and interest due 118 80 months after full drawdown. C. Interest is payable at a rate of 4% per annum, subject to a change in line with the general level of fluctuating rates. And whereas, for the corporate credit card with a limit of 150,000 EC, A. Repayment is monthly. B, interest is payable in accordance with visa terms and conditions. Be it resolved that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to guarantee a line of credit from First National Bank St. Lucia Limited, the bank, to the Millennium Heights Medical Complex in the amount of EC $223,050,000, <coughs> consisting of A, an overdraft limit of $6.5 million EC, to assist with working capital requirements, B, a loan of 5 million EC to assist with operational expenses for the purpose of new equipment, or for the purchase of new equipment, C, a loan of 11,400,000 Eastern Caribbean dollars to satisfy a debt of the Ministry of Finance, and D, a corporate credit card with a limit of 150,000 EC dollars to assist with monthly expenses. Be it further resolved that A, for the overdraft limit of 6.5 million, one, the term of the overdraft is for 12 months, two, interest is payable at 6% per annum, subject to the change in line with the general level of interest rates, excess rates of 17%. B, for the loan of 5 million, the interest on the loan is for 180 months. Two, that's B1. B2, repayment for is $36,985 monthly with effect from one month after the drawdown with the last payment plus any outstanding principal and interest due 180 months after the full drawdown. Three. Interest, rates, interest is payable at a rate of 4% per annum, subject to the change in line with the general level of functioning fluctuating rates. C, for the loan of $11,400,000. One, the term of the loan is for 180 months. Two, repayment is for $84,324 monthly, with effect from one month after drawdown with the last payment plus any outstanding principal and interest due 180 months after full drawdown. Three, 
interest is payable at a rate of 4% per annum, subject to the change in line with the general levels of fluctuating rates. D, for the corporate credit card with a limit of 150,000 EC, one, repayment is monthly, two, interest is payable in accordance with visa terms and conditions. Madam President, um, Mr. Deputy President, this time I didn't sit just to make sure that um, I did not um, give the, the impression that I was not going to elucidate. Uh, Mr. Deputy, <laughs> the, this specific motion is really seeking the government's um, approval for the government to borrow 22, just about 23 million um, EC dollars. And there's, I've given a breakdown in the resolution as to what the various different um, amounts will be used for. I wish at this time, instead of going into all the details of the breakdown again, just to highlight uh, what exactly the, you know, what exactly is the purpose. And so I hope I should do that quite briefly um, and not have a drawn, a long extended explanation since the resolution itself was very um, explicit and, and detailed. Madam President, we heard about the credit card. That is really to make it easy to be able to access um, payments and uh, make payments, particularly on a monthly basis. We, we do note that there are some issues with that, but I think the staff will be very, it's very convenient uh, method of being able to access um, what we need. Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy, out of the five million of in operational expenses, 12 wards will be repaired. Um, I think we also included here the sewage and waste treatment facilities at the, the, the facility. 1.7 million will be used for that. A backup generator, about 8 .5, 850,000 will be used for that. Solar panels have been looked into, building maintenance and fire, alarms, all of these are examples of where some of these monies are going to. But Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy, there's one, one point I want to make, and that is with regard to the 11.4 million EC dollars, that as the, the motion indicated, is for paying existing debt. Now, while the motion did not indicate what debt, I would like for the benefit of the Senate to indicate clearly what we mean by that debt. Madam President, Mr. Deputy President, uh, you may recall that there has been a long drawn out discussion about an entity that we refer to as Health City Cayman, mm -hmm. contracted to provide some services and when you heard services, you would think that these services are not available in this country and we had to source them outside. Contracted for about two years, and when we did the math, we break down the payments, it would amount to about one million EC dollars every month. You see, we've been here borrowing, Mr. Deputy, and you heard the opposition giving us all kinds of, you know, reprimanding us and chastising us and telling us stuff about why we have to borrow. You see why, Mr. Deputy President? Because here we were contracting a firm to do things that our public servants and our St. Lucian folk can do. In fact, the transition team that was put in place, headed by Dr. King, well-known and well-respected medical practitioner here, has been a chief medical officer, one of the most competent 
persons you will find in this country along the lines of public health. Headed that team. We had also on that team a top medical director from of, uh, the city of Bordeaux in France. Um, very, very high level, very well skilled gentleman working with the team. Please note, Mr. Deputy, uh, Deputy President, not on, on our payroll. The only thing we had to provide for him was accommodation. Coming here from Bordeaux, France, top medical man, giving us free service, quality, high level quality service for free. Headed by Dr. King, who was getting a stipend that would not even equate to the salary of a PS. And having that transition team in place. But you know what? We felt that uh, St. Lucian's man, we, we, we're not smart enough. We, we don't know what we're doing. We've got to bring in some guys from somewhere else with some fancy names. And then we, we're going to have to pay them a million dollars a month. Wow. And then we're going to be coming here and we're very proud to borrow, to be able to borrow, to be able to, find, to fund that kind of service, to tell us what we already know. And we want to call them consultants. You don't know what we want to call them. But, Mr. Deputy President, it is now on our backs to pay that debt. And so almost half, if you do the math, 11.4 million, almost half of the monies that we are borrowing in this motion are going to go, are going to be used to pay for that particular debt that was incurred on the backs of this, of these, of the people of this country because the government felt that we couldn't take care of this, our business ourselves. And here are some of the things we were paying these people for. Communication and press releases. Mr. President, Mr. Deputy President, when I was the president of a club named Fire Strikers Youth and Sports Club, and we prepared our, our bylaws, one of the, when I was going through the responsibilities of the public relations officer in a little club somewhere in the Rousseau, as a teen, one of the responsibilities of the PRO was to release, along with the president, to issue and release press, um, to do press releases. You know, <laughs> You know, something that young people in a club can do. Once you, you get a little bit of advice, you can do a press release. But we were paying a million dollars a month. Press release? Mr. Deputy President, these are some of the things you were paying for. And so, I don't want to, to, I don't want to bore you, Mr. <laughs> or burden you. Because if I have to, you'll probably be depressed by the time you leave here. With some of the reasons why we try to justify Hiring a firm to be able to, or, or to do what we, 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 we consider our people in this country cannot do. So, here we are today. We have to pay back because we borrow. And like I said earlier, when you borrow, the government of St. Lucia is, the, is, is who borrows. It's not the Labour Party or the UWP. That debt is on our backs, and we have to be good clients. We have to be responsible as a government. We cannot give ourselves a bad name in, ter in terms of inter international financial com community, and we have to honor the commitments that the government has made. So this government will have to swallow the hard pill. While we try to use about half of the money to do the things that I described, we, have, we are stuck with a debt of $11.4 million that we have nothing to do with. When I say we, those of us sitting on this side now have nothing to do. We did not borrow. We did not hire any Cayman group. We didn't do it. But we have inherited that. And as a government, when you get into you're office, in you're in <laughs> you have to deal with what you find. And so we will have to honor painfully, we'll have to honor the commitment that was made and try to see how we can pay back. So, so Mr. Deputy, I know now that the opposition, I, I await their response because I want them to be able to explain to us why we should be coming here to borrow half of the sum of money for OKEU to finance a debt that was completely unnecessary. Completely unnecessary.
So with that, Mr. Deputy President, I will pause and allow for the debate to continue. Well, Mr. Deputy, I take that to mean that members are very satisfied with where we are, and so I will ask that the, uh, the Senate considers this motion and we can proceed. I thank you, Mr. Deputy. Senators, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to guarantee a letter of credit, a line of credit, sorry, from First National Bank, Senusha Limited, the bank, to Millennium Heights Medical Complex in the amount of EC $23,050,000, consisting of A, an overdraft limit of EC $6,500,000 to assist with working capital requirements, B, a loan of $5 million to assist with the operational expenses for the purchase of new equipment, C, a loan of $11,400,000 to satisfy a debt of the Ministry of Finance, and D, a corporate credit card with a limit of EC $150,000 to assist with monthly expenses. Be it further resolved that A, the overdraft limit of $6,500,000 of EC, $6,500,000, one, the term of the overdraft is 12 months, two, Interest is payable at 6% per annum, subject to a change in line with the general rates of interest, excess rates of 17%. B, the loan of EC $5 million. One, the term of the loan is 180 months. Two, repayment is $36,985 monthly, with effect from one month after drawdown with the last payments plus any outstanding principal and interest due 180 months after full drawdown. Three, interest is payable at a rate of 4% per annum, subject to a change in line with the general level of fluctuating rates. C, for the loan of 11 million EC, 11 million 400 EC, the 11 million 400 thousand EC, one, the term of the loan is 180 months. Two, repayment is for $84,324 monthly with effect from one month after drawdown with the last payment plus any outstanding principal and interest thereon due 180 months after full drawdown. Three, interest is payable at a rate of 4% per annum subject to a change in line with the general level of fluctuating rates. D, for the corporate credit card, with a limit of 150,000 EC. Re one, repayment is monthly. Two, interest is payable in accordance with visa terms and conditions. I now put the question. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Mr. Deputy President, before I proceed with the next bill, um, I wish to invoke uh, Standing Order 9 3 just to make sure I have it correct, to allow the sitting to proceed between the hours of 6, the Senate to proceed between the hours of 6 and 7.30 and p.m. Senators, the question is that standing order 9, no, just now. You, you asked. Okay. Senators, the question is that standing order 9.3 be suspended to enable the Senate to sit beyond the prescribed time of 6 o'clock in the afternoon. I now put the question, as many of that opinion say aye. Aye. 
as many of a contrary opinion say no, I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Leave granted. Please proceed, um, Honorable Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I move for the second reading of a bill shortly entitled Cons uh, Constitutional Amendment, St. Lucia Constitution Amendment Number 2. Let me make sure I have everything in place right. Mr. President, there is a real context to this bill. And the bill here for consideration uh, really is not just one of those where you make an amendment to an existing bill or a minor change. This is a constitutional amendment. And constitutional amendments are only made when there is a specific composition of the House. And it is absolutely historic that this amendment is being made at this time. There are two things it tells us, that when the people give you a certain mandate, there are certain things that you may not have another opportunity to address if you procrastinate. And secondly, that it is not very often that the people have decided to give you such a mandate. So, Mr. President, Mr. Deputy President, this amendment is to the, the Constitution, Section 36. We saw in about five years plus, as we sometimes say, that the then United Workers Party government did not find it, in five years plus, did not find it convenient, as the provision is made in that section, to appoint a deputy speaker. And so, we were held in constitutional hostage, if I may use, for want of a better term, and I sat here many times observing the then female member, the then female um, speaker <coughs> having to endure the pain of sitting in this chair without getting relief. And even at times when we had to have suspension of the House. Mr. Deputy President, I saw subsequent sittings after the first sitting, the, op the opening of Parliament, where the Speaker called for members to elect a Deputy Speaker. And then, total of about 1,758 days later, the constitutional, the, the, the convenience was never found. And so, to date, we speak about it. But when the tides changed. The people knew that it was wrong. They voted this government out, got rid of that problem that we had, gave us a mandate, and I think the people knew exactly why they gave us a mandate of more than two-thirds. The people of St. Lucia are amazing, Mr. Deputy President. They, they know what to do. They knew. They knew that if they had not given us that mandate, that subsequent governments could have done the same thing. And so they made sure that never again in the history of our democracy that any government would be able to abuse the privilege and treat the Constitution in the way that they did. And so, Madam President, Mr. Deputy, 13 plus 2, 15 seats were decided and now we can come back and right the wrong. Mr. Deputy President, you may not recall, I know we are probably in the same age group, but just a little bit of history, successive governments of this country since independence have found it convenient as the, the sessions of parliament open 
should elect a deputy speaker. Successive governments, from Sir John Compton all the way down. And let me just remind you, Mr. Deputy, of some of these persons who have been elected as deputy speaker. And there are times when the majority, sorry, the, 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 the margin was very small, 10, 10, 7, you know, 9, 8. But the then father of the nation that they hypocritically boast about found it necessary to elect. When the opposition did not nominate, he stood up as a man of, you know, of, of value. Maybe his current leader has not learned from him. A man who is still referred to as the father of the nation decided that he would do the right thing. And so we had the late Kenneth Foster, the likes of Cecily, Eldridge Stevens, and they come from both sides, Madam, Mr. Deputy. Both Labour Party, uh, MPs, persons who represented the UWP, they have come from both sides. So Kenneth Foster, the late Cecily, Eldridge Stevens, the late Alan Buske, one of my favorite politicians, I must say, Marcus Nicholas, Desmond Long, all of these persons, Mr. Deputy, have been persons who have served in the position of Deputy Speaker. So between 2016 and 2021, all of a sudden, something happened in this country, and it's not convenient. Well, it has now become convenient as we turn the tides that this government has made sure that at every sitting since we got into office, that in this parliament we have had a Deputy Speaker. We have had one. And so, we proceed to get it right. So, we are remaining obedient to the Constitution, Section 41.1, and to Section 41.6a, which requires a 90-day period. That is why we came and we had a first reading, gave the time, obedient to the Constitution, and continued from where we had stopped or left off in 2015, when a committee had been set up to look at that reform, which the then government saw no reason to actually engage in. The opposition leader, now uh, Prime Minister, participated in that consultation that, that was supposed to happen in constitutional reform. So we, we made ourselves available as an opposition. Members were nominated, Mr. Deputy. The then opposition nominated members to serve on that Constitution Reform Committee, as the, the, the then government requested. So we were cooperating. But then the committee never convened. Nothing was done. So we now have a situation that the position of Deputy Speaker will not have to be a position of an elected member to force anyone into the position that we, had, we have seen of late. And so this amendment seeks to allow for someone other than an elected member to be able to serve as a deputy speaker. That is essentially the essence of that amendment. And so without giving more information. There's a lot more I could have said, Mr. Deputy, but I'm conscious of the time and, you know, the existing conditions and consider it to all of us that I will take a pause here and ask that we uh, make or approve of this constitutional amendment to make it possible as of today or as of now that it, the position of Deputy Speaker may not necessarily have to be filled in by someone who is an elected member of the House. I thank you, Mr. Deputy. Senator Feely. Thank you indeed, um, Mr. President. This is a very... Sorry, sorry. Yes. My apologies. 
Senators, the question is that the Constitutional Amendment Number 2, Amendment Bill, be read a second time. Thank you again, Mr. Deputy President. Mr. President, this is a very important discussion that needs to examine carefully the relevant clauses of the Constitution that speaks to the Deputy Speaker, that speaks to the composition of the House of Assembly, but also the relevant sections that speaks to on whose burden it is to elect a Deputy Speaker. So, Mr. President, I was part of the Madam President, welcome back. I was part of the regime that came under severe criticism for our own interpretation of what the Constitution has said. And this became uh, a very uh, big sounding board of the then opposition. Section 30 of the Constitution is quite clear about the composition of Parliament. And I want to start off with Section 30, where it says, one, the House shall consist of such number of, su such number of members as, corris as, corris as corresponds with the number of constituencies for the time being established in accordance with the provisions of Section 58 of this Constitution. Who shall be elected in accordance with the provisions of Section 33 of this Constitution? So it says every constituency shall have a member of the House. So first we have the elected MPs. Two, if a person who is not a member of the House is elected to be Speaker, he shall by virtue of holding or acting in that office be a member of the House. So the Speaker is also a member of the House. The third uh, component of the composition of the House is the Attorney General. In Section 30, Subsection 3 of the Constitution, it says, at any time when the office of the Attorney General is a public office, the Attorney General shall, by, by virtue of holding or acting in that office, be a member of the House. So we've got the 17 MPs, we've got the um, Attorney General, and we've got the Speaker of the House that make up the composition of the House in accordance with the Constitution. I want to turn to Section 36, which speaks specifically to the Deputy Speaker. And it says the following. When the House, meaning uh, the opposition members, all 17 members, those that are on the opposition side and those that are on the government side, when the House first meets after any general elections of members and before it proceeds to the dispatch of any other business except the election of the Speaker, the House shall elect a member of the House, opposition or government side, anybody can hold a position, who is not a member of the Cabinet or a Parliamentary Secretary to the position of Deputy Speaker of the House. And if the office of the Deputy Speaker falls vacant at any time before the next dissolution of Parliament, the House, the House shall as soon as convenient, elect another member of the House to that office. No mention of the executive, no mention of the burden placed on the members who make up the group of a majority who then goes on to form the government. It is explicitly clear in the Constitution that it is the responsibility of all members of the House. Now, it was said by my learned friend, the leader of government business, that the UWP administration did not find it necessary or convenient 
to have a deputy speaker for five years. Therefore, strongly implying that there was no responsibility on the members of the opposition to uh, elect or ensure that the deputy speaker is part and parcel of that process. This is totally in contravention of the Constitution, that assertion, because the Constitution actually places the burden on every single member of the, the House as a totality that has to ensure that there is a deputy speaker. I can tell you that during that time, members of the opposition were nominated and they refused, they declined to be deputy speakers. And the record will show if we look at Hansard. And the senator was a very regular member of lower sittings, um, lower house sittings uh, at that time. I saw him regularly in the gallery behind me, was his favorite spot. And I'm sure that he would have seen that on many occasions, whenever this came up, the members of the opposition, in fact, the leader of the opposition was then quizzed about this. And he was said, it is not in the interest of the Labour Party's voting position to, at that time, fill the office of the Deputy Speaker. And so those facts and those, that part of history must be recounted for us to give full context to this debate. And so you want to blame the UWP administration? One might say that they are ultimately responsible. One view might say that the convention to, should take precedence over the letter of the Constitution. The letter of the law places the burden on the elected members of the entire House. It doesn't say anything about the members of the House that form the majority. And, and that is my reading of this the constitution is explicitly clear about whose responsibility it is to uh, nominate a deputy speaker so i understand that for political reasons we're going to hold a certain um, position we're going to have a certain interpretation because it, it would suit our political line of argument but if we're going to be true to what the constitution says it is explicitly clear that it is, in fact, the uh, members of the House. In fact, um, on occasion, Madam President, in history, they were members of, the, there were deputy speakers who were not necessarily uh, aligned to the government side that have held the office of the uh, deputy speaker because, again, the responsibility was not that of the government side, but it was the responsibility of the total house as a collective. The, the member sort of implied um, earlier in the previous debate uh, a related point to suggest that the, the Senate and the opposition side is also part of the government. And it is in that spirit of collectivity that the house also is burdened with the responsibility by the framers of our constitution to elect a deputy speaker. Um, and it is clear. So section 36 is, is quite uh, an instruction. The only disqualification is that that person shall not be a parliamentary secretary or shall not be a member of the cabinet. And for obvious reasons, the framers of our constitution is seeking here to achieve the separation of, of duties, whereby as much as possible that the executive arm of government is going to be a separate from the, um, the legislature. But in a small parliament, and I think Senator Daniel, um, who has done quite well um, here today, although he's been very humble in calling himself the rookie and all kinds of things, um, has done exceptionally well in his debates, and I think he pointed out that, I'm sorry if I'm misquoting you, but I would remember sometime today it was floated that in very small parliaments, it is very difficult for us to achieve the level of separation, because very often you have um, most of the MPs, it wasn't you? 
Well, then, this is a point I would like to submit whether you mentioned it or not. But it is very hard in small chambers like ours. Yeah? Um, no, no, um, Senator Fede, I didn't say that um, today. Okay, um, well, my apologies. It's possible maybe you listen yeah. to my to excuse, my excuse, to my excuse, program um, on the media. Me, um, I'm sorry, can you, I'm sorry. Yes, are you standing on a point of order, Senator well, On a point Daniel? of clarification. Point of clarification. Uh, he remembers me as are saying you, something. Are you yielding, um, Senator? Okay. Yeah. No, proceed, I think, proceed, no, Senator I think the Senator is attributing to me something which I may have said, but not um, in this um, chamber today something put in into small parliaments and having you know people to have divided rules and so on between them so it's probably that you conflated something that i may have said on a on a media program that i was no really injury but uh, nothing like that did i utter in this um senate uh well thank you very much for the clarification senator but um the point has to be submitted uh notwithstanding that in very small parliaments like ours it is very difficult to achieve the level of separation that the framers of our constitution intended to have. And that is, if you look at the Westminster system, you've got 650 MPs in the British Parliament. If you've got 20, uh, if let's say the government, which needs 326 to win uh, the government, they can have 20, 30, and they would still have a significant backbench to choose from. And by having that backbench, they would have achieved the, the separation that, our, that the framers of our constitution would have intended, and that is to have the executive the, and the parliament as separate as possible. And then the parliament then, in situations like those, are going to have the ability to be able to then play an oversight role. But in our instance, you've got a very small parliament, and very often, the majority of the members on the, on the majority side of the parliament is given oversight to the very same policies and the very same bills and procedures that they would have approved in the cabinet. So it is almost... Uh, 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 a rule that is not achieved um, uh, here it, it's an exercise in fertility because the same individuals in the cabinet are the same individuals given oversight in the chamber so the constitution though in the case of the deputy speaker was trying to ensure that the deputy speaker is not in the executive the deputy speaker is not in the cabinet and the deputy speaker would be one that would be part of the backbench. Now in our own political reality, in our own political reality, it is often very difficult for um, someone who is elected um, and to be the deputy speaker. I remember when at my entrance into politics, we had a, a member in Ancillary Canneries um, who was elected to be the MP for that area. And the residents felt that he should have been, being a medical doctor, he should have been appointed the Minister of Health, was the opinion held by the constituents. But then he instead was placed as the Deputy Speaker. Now, it didn't help his own image in our culture, neither did it help his own re-electability, because that is the reality of the situation. And I'm not saying this, that that, was, that had any bearing on the decision that was made in the past. But what I'm saying is that this is the reality of what is happening now. And I mean, it, it, it raises a very important question though, whether this is the reason that the Labour Party is now um, coming to ensure that you amend the constitution so that you can have all of the members that you have, as many as you would like of elected members, to be in the cabinet. That's a real question that emerges. And that's a question only you can answer. But the question looms large, and I think it is something that you certainly must address. Um, because it is very apparent in our political context 
that when a member who would have gone to an election, contest an election, the people vote for that member, and then he or she is not placed in the cabinet where they are of the impression that that member is at the seat of decision making and then is therefore able to leverage that much more uh, resources for his or her constituency. That's a reality. That's the mindset of a lot of electorates in this country. And if the Labour Party is um, now going to make an amendment to change the constitution so that you can bring someone from the outside, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. But what I have a problem with is you placing the responsibility and referencing the constitution incorrectly because it never said that the executive it always placed the burden on the entire house. What I also find interesting, um, and a question that I want to ask, is that I have seen on many instances where if a political party, except the, um, especially the Labour Party in, in recent vintage, if you find that a matter violates the Constitution, I wonder why you did not seek uh, a, a judicial um, interference or a judicial review on the, on the specific interpretation of the Constitution, which you felt to be wrong. But you sat here for five years, you complained in the House that this was unconstitutional, but yet you did nothing about it. And so, does that also make you complicit? in this important matter, which you, uh, the opposition members on the benches then, also had the responsibility to, to solve and to correct. If you felt that this matter was, was wrong. But clearly, I, real, I think that when you take a very critical legal look at the Constitution, you would have seen that the responsibility was on the entire House and not just the executive members of the government. So, um, going and amend the Constitution to bring in someone on the outside to be a member, I, I have two, two concerns. One is, I want to make sure that there are specific guidelines as to who the member that's coming from outside the house. I mean, is, is it going to be a, a, a person with a great understanding of legal matters, constitutional administrative matters? I think that there ought to be some guideline and don't just leave it open to just any person who's outside the house. And this is what I think that this is trying to do. So I have that concern in how this can be improved to ensure that there are guidelines in terms of how you appoint that person. Number two is, I also believe that this is a time for both political parties, and, and you have the mandate to do it um, with your 15 majority, is that the time has now come for the depoliticization of the chair, whether it is in the lower house or the upper house. And so, you know, persons who have been um, very close to the political space, I think should be disqualified from chairing uh, parliaments, from chairing president sessions, because it's no, it's no attack to anybody. Both political parties have made political appointments, and I'm, I'm saying so, but if we are going to improve our democracy, if we are going to improve our space, then it is my belief that what we should do is that we should try as much as possible to ensure that individuals who have not been involved in the politics, that these individuals are considered first and foremost for presiding over these sessions. And so it is, it is absolutely crucial. And, I, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a suggestion that I am making for our side as well, so that we can ensure that our democracy functions in the very best way. If you, you're gonna, okay, 
So let's say I retire from politics and I put my, I point the finger to myself. And then you're gonna ask me to come to sit in a, a, a presiding role. And then you expect me to not have any affiliation whatsoever or any sympathy uh, for members on the side of the political aisle that I support. So, so basically, what I'm saying is because we're so close to the action, to improve our parliament, it would serve both the country and the two main political parties well to improve the democracy. The, the, the legislature is an important and critical role by which our democracy can improve. And if we don't get this right, the, the responsibilities and the functions of the parliament are going to be undermined. And so let us not put people in such a position. Let us, let us ensure that we give the parliament the very best chance to be as impartial as possible. Now, I have another question. So, the other section of the Constitution and the manner in which this is being done. So, Section 30 speaks to the composition of the Parliament. And we went through the elected members, the Speaker of the House, as well as the um, Attorney General. The Deputy Speaker, as mentioned in Section 36. Now, if you're going to amend Section 36, the question arises, do you also have to amend Section 30 of the Constitution? And if you do, then it raises another question, because Section 30 of the Constitution happens to be in Schedule 1. And in Section 41, 6, sub, 6, subsection B of the Constitution says that if a bill provides for the alteration of this section, Schedule 1 to this Constitution, or any provisions of this Constitution, or the Supreme Court order specified in the schedule, unless after it has been passed by the Senate and the House, in the case of a bill which section 50 of this constitution applies after its rejection by the Senate for the second time, the bill has been approved on a referendum held in accordance with such provisions as may be in that behalf by parliament, by a majority of votes val validly cast on that referendum. So what I am reading this to what say. What section again? Repeat, please. Yeah, that's um, Constitution section 41, um, section 41, subsection 6B. Yeah. Proceed. Yeah. Thank you, Madam, Pre Madam President. So, so therefore, it it goes on to say that in in section six. A bill to alter any provisions in this constitution or the Supreme Court, Court order shall not be submitted to the Governor General for his assent unless these things happen. A, it goes on to say. But in B, one of the things that it lists, it says that you need a referendum. So it is therefore for you. I'm no lawyer, but I'm submitting to you whether that important question does not arise out of this debate. Because one is, we're going to amend the Constitution. Section 30 talks about the composition of the Parliament. And if subsection 30 is then in Schedule 1, then it would, it would appear that a referendum is needed for this to be implemented. So it is for you to consult your legal people and, and for them to give you the appropriate answers 
on what is required here. But it is a very, very interesting um, point to note. Madam President, I want to submit this for the House's attention, and I thank you very, very much for your indulgence. Senator Daniel. Thank you very much, Madam President. And now I'm not going to refer to myself as an amateur anymore, but right. I think I'm experiencing within my own self a bit of evolution because <laughs> earlier in the day, I would not have dared to be the first one to speak in response <laughs> to an opposition member, much less the honorable leader of opposition business. But I want to suggest that it is a practice so normal as to be considered a convention, albeit a tacit one, that those who hold the power normally accept responsibility for the things that require and are facilitated by the exercise of that power. And so you win an election, you have the majority in the parliament, in the elected House of Representatives, and according to the proportionate appointments, you automatically are guaranteed a majority in the unelected upper house where we are today, in the Senate. And it has been a convention that all governments, even those, even those who are forced to walk the knife edge of the most slender majorities, have accepted, have accepted the decisive responsibility of nominating and ensuring the appointment of a deputy speaker. They have not subjected it to any gamesmanship whether it was Sir John Compton if his 298 results in 1987 subsequently turned into a 107 by a defection. But no government has ever made it a problem for the appointment of a deputy speaker to engage in any kind of bickering or what we call halikasi over it. They've taken it that this is our job, our preeminent duty to select and appoint from among our own unless the opposition says we okay with it most times they don't i think all times the opposition don't want because they want the government to bear as many burdens upon its numerical advantage and so governments have never made this a problem until the government until the government of 2016 to 2021 of which my good friend my former co-worker we good was a member of that government, he sat in the cabinet. He was an elected member of it. I don't speak of what he remembers me as saying, and maybe he thought, you know, there's sometimes some leakage of the consciousness, you know? The consciousness, the mind leaks as to where did I really hear that and so on. And so I understand. As my friend in the media, by the way, former co worker, like I said, colleague, he probably heard me say, and here's what I said that even when governments, and I lived in another Caribbean country, but it wasn't even while I was there, it was after I was back in St. Lucia that general elections were held. And a result that the government got was in a 17 seat elected legislature, they got nine seats. The combined opposition forces got eight seats. Not once did that government equivocate and vacillate and tremble at the knees about taking one of its own and immediately, even before the parliament had met, nominating and deciding that the oldest of elder statesmen of that party, the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party, a man who has been continuously in the parliament since 1976, who is in his 80s, who is considered to be a veteran among veterans, to nominate him, Sir Robin Yearwood, to be the deputy speaker. No problem about that. So that now means that in the event that the speaker is unavailable and this deputy speaker has to sit in the chair, you know what that means. 
eight on this side, eight on the other side. They did not make it a problem. But we don't even need to draw references from other Caribbean countries. What was most shocking, what was most egregious, what was most ludicrous about the St. Lucia situation? The two things. The government of 2016 to 2021 was not faced with any knife edge situation. They were, didn't have their back to the wall. They were not in anything that said, oh my, if we give up one of our own to be the deputy speaker, we might have our backs to the wall and we might find ourselves in a situation where, you know, our member is in the chair and, you know, is an 8 8 situation and things might be hung where the vote is concerned. Although I'm not too sure whether the deputy speaker has casting vote like speaker has whatever, okay? But regardless of it, let us say if it had been a 9 8 situation or even a 10 7 situation, you might have said that there was a little bit of fear and uncertainty and nervousness about nominating one of your own. You won an election 11-6. 11-6. If you appoint one of your own or nominate one of your own to become deputy speaker as was done, and I want to get to that point, you know, when you already have a problem solved and you're going back and you're unsolving the problem and you're causing a problem, that is the weird thing about what happened in 2016. You have 11-6. You give up one of your own to be deputy speaker. It's not that in the case of crossing the floor where 9-8-10 turns to a 10-7. Because it means government gains one and opposition loses one. You would still have a situation where your majority of five would simply change in a situation where the deputy speaker has to occupy the chair. You still have a margin of four. It would still be effectively 10, you know, six. So it's not that you you on any kind of knife edge where things are desperate. This is the bizarre thing about the situation. Where you have already done things, you have acknowledged your preeminent responsibility as the one who has power by dint of the majority. You have already resolved the problem. You have already taken care of the issues. You have already nominated one of your own who is duly voted upon and accepted to be the deputy speaker. That's not an issue. And then you turn it around and you're taking that person out of the deputy position, deputy speaker position, and appointing the person to a cabinet post. That is the bizarre thing, and that is the thing which demonstrates a lack of regard for constitutionality. You're already in conformity. You had done what was necessary, but then you went and you undo what you've done already. And that is what we're asking, and now you want to come as if after the fact, like an afterthought, you want to say to the, to the opposition, oh, well, it's not just our responsibility, you know. Yes. It's your responsibility to, okay, why didn't you say that at the very start? True, true. Why did you take the responsibility and you made one of your own deputy speaker and then you unmade, you remove, you revoke, you change, you turn upside down when the situation was solved already? Yes. You know? And there seems to be this preoccupation, this fixation, this obsession that the amendment to the constitution has to do with wanting to give some job to the boys and so on. You want to tell me one position that we're going to be over the possibility that a government supporter, you know, are going to get over that? If anything, here's what I would say. That the impetus for amending the constitution, I'm not going to go into the legalities of referendum, I think... The senator did not do a good job re reading the section, which said if in the case that the Senate has more than once rejected it, then you might need other means to get its approval. I think we have to read things if we're holistic, but I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to go there. People better qualified than me. I think the constitutional issues of referendum and whether we need referendum, they have been dealt with and they have been ruled upon by a court of competent jurisdiction. But I believe the senator needs to tell himself that just as the leader of, go of, of government business here made the point that they used this thing about whenever convenient and inconvenience that lasted for the better part of five years, five years. even to tell me almost a whole parliamentary term went up with whether it was convenient well I think what senator leader of government business senator Ferdinand said no, no, what our leader of government business said was that that inconvenience seemed to have lasted so long that the people relieved you of that inconvenience. Aye. 
July, in July 2021, the people saw that this inconvenience had been allowed to persist for long enough and they gave you some relief. They took you out of your misery on that one because you had a problem that was solved and you went back. Therefore, you need to ask yourself the question that when this government decides a government which has a 15 to 2 majority, so the issue of giving up one of their own, there ain't no inconvenience, there ain't no loss, there ain't no anything about it. You know, if it is that they feel that, you know, I mean, they have the numbers that they can juggle with. So obviously, it is not a self serving thing. It is saying that in the history of our parliament, a situation arose unnecessarily, something quite eerie, something quite. <laughs> You can say something that, that, that would freak us out when we think about it. Where a government that had a fairly comfortable majority had already done the right thing, undid the right thing, did the wrong thing, violated the constitution, showed disregard and disrespect for it, and sat upon it. Therefore, if that degree of embarrassment over an inconvenience that was inconsequential, nothing turned on it, then maybe what we need to do now is to ensure that in the future it does not become an issue. If you could have felt so uncomfortable and so uneasy with an 11 to 6 majority, that would have effectively turned, if you want to use the argument, to a 10 6. Yet you could have been so nervous about it. Not for ourselves, because we're sitting pretty on 15 to 2. But should it ever come back, God forbid, that the same people or like minded people hold the reins of power in terms of the majority numbers then that they will not have to be sweating bullets over taking one of their own and making them deputy speaker my final point on this madam speaker my final point on this one i hear senator Fede, leader of opposition business making the point about the need to depoliticize appointments Senator, I honestly don't know how we can depoliticize what is in itself the very essence of politics. Parliament, its composition, its members, its debates, its resolutions, its motions, how people get there through getting elected and appointment. The moment you are a member of parliament, even when you're unelected, you are a politician. I am now a politician, if only for a day. <laughs> I don't like that I'm a politician. Once you engage in the business of government, in the business of legislation, in the business of parliament, in the business of bills and laws and motions and so on, you are political. You are a politician. And the things you do are political things. So all your actions pertaining to deputy speaker, all my presentation, speaking to yours, responding to yours, it is a political process. We too like to behave as if politics is a dirty word, mm -hmm. as if it is something to be ashamed of, mm -hmm. as if it is something that we have to treat like it is some kind of disease, some kind of leprosy that we need to be ceremoniously and otherwise cleansed of. There is dignity and there is honor in politics. As I think you know, as I think you want to aspire to, we just have to conduct our politics well, in accordance with the rules, in accordance with the law, in accordance with constitution, and in accordance with our own honesty about the journey with which things have traveled. Let's not get into this thing about being ashamed of politics. We have enough people out there who are selling the message that politicians are contemptible people, that politicians are disdainful, that politicians are people that we should, you know, despise and so on. Let us not be politicians and be perpetuating that myth. The dignity of politics, the responsibility of it, the proper exercise of power of it, the proper brokering when you don't have the majority. These are all parts of the negotiating ways that we have to go through in our politics. Always remembering the body politic, always remembering the wider country and the good that we must do for it and the good we must do by it, regardless of whether we are on the majority or on the minority side. And I want to suggest that this matter of the deputy speaker business. It is one of the shameful and despicable episodes in the history of our parliament and in the history of our politics. And I believe 
what this constitution amendment seeks to do is to cure any inclination of fear or anxiety that might lead us to go down this blatantly unconstitutional road, road that we took over a matter of an appointment of a deputy speaker which was never on the knife edge as Antigua and Barbuda found itself yet did it without any difficulty yet it was made a problem and it was made a problem after that problem had already been addressed settled and resolved Madam President I thank you Senator Lee thank you Madam President um, just permit me to make a few observations and comments on the amendment bill, um, which is before us today. Um, I just want to start by noting that the Constitution, or our Constitution, is what we call in law a living document. It is one that takes effect through practice, through operation, and through liberal interpretation. It's expected to continue without the possibility of amendment for indefinitely. And so therefore, you have to constantly um, fill in the cracks, so to speak. Uh, and that is done largely through what is called conventions. It's impossible for a constitution to capture every single event that might be covered by its terms. And so oftentimes, practices arise around the constitutional provisions, which enable it to operate and to work. And perhaps one of the conventions that we have developed in St. Lucia had been the manner in which the deputy speaker was appointed. So I heard the leader of opposition business saying that the convention trumped or was attempting to trump the law or the constitution, but that is not what happens. In fact, the convention works in conjunction with the constitution to, to um, ensure that the constitution is operative and can operate. And so therefore, the question of who had responsibility was addressed through the convention that it was the government side who would appoint the deputy speaker. Um, unfortunately, the circumstance, I'm not going to go into the politics of the situation and circumstance um, that arose, but perhaps it is the logical conclusion of what I have seen developing in our politics, which is that every single member who gets elected believes that they have some divine right to be in the cabinet. The Constitution does not operate that way. Our, com our, democ our democracy, sorry, our democratic structure, sorry, is what I want to say, which is derived from Whitehall. I heard, again, the leader of, of opposition business speaking to the size of our cabinet, of our um, House of Assembly. But I believe, and in some ways, when we look at it, the activities of the member for Viewfort South make exactly the point of why you need to have backbenchers. No matter how small your parliament is, you need to have persons who stand apart and outside of the cabinet, who can make independent, notwithstanding that they're part of the government, but make independent contributions to the legislation that is before us and assist in its development and its structuring. Because what has happened in our politics is that the legislature has unfortunately been captured by the executive. And so decisions that are being taken in cabinet are what then become de facto laws without any, no matter what we say in here at times, because the, everybody who is in cabinet sits, sorry, everybody who is on the government side sits in cabinet. Whatever decisions they take, they're going to vote for. That is not how our democracy is meant to work. We have separation of powers. Each of the tripartite and my, my our, our um, new found friend has made the point that we have a tripartite government system and the tripod requires that each of the elements work together but still stand apart and so when you have a situation where cabinet has controlled or controls the legislature whatever decisions for whatever political reasons are taken in in cabinet then become the law regardless of what else we might say and unfortunately that is what oftentimes leads to bad laws being passed because there's nobody who's standing aside from the, the cabinet and its interests to point out the defects. Or even when those defects are pointed out, because they have sufficient numbers to drown out those concerns, they don't take it on. So I would like to encourage 
and I know they probably won't, I probably won't be listened to, but that the prime ministers from now going forward, when they are appointing the cabinet, take into consideration the value that is brought to our democracy in having backbenchers. Ironically, I think it actually empowers the prime minister because it means he now has the power to tell persons, well, if you go behave yourself, I'll take that back bench and replace you. But as it is right now, where everybody is a cabinet minister, to my mind, it ties the hands of the prime minister a bit. So there is value in having backbenchers, and I think it's something that we need to look at more closely. I'm, and I heard the leader of government business making the point that it's not often that we have a sufficient majority to make these changes to the constitution. And, and so some, I'm somewhat disheartened that the government has decided to take a sort of very piecemeal, and if I dare say, self-serving approach to the amendment of the constitution. I would think that a constitutional reform commission having been appointed, and having given its report as far back as 2011, a 300 plus page report, where there was consultation island-wide, solutions of all walks of life contributed and made their contribution as to what they wanted to see in our constitutional documents. That report was presented with detailed amendments to the constitution that everybody would benefit from. That we get a bill that merely deals with the speaker, I, Deputy Speaker, sorry. I accept that perhaps a crisis may have arisen in our constitutional construct. Somewhat, to be honest, from an academic point of view, because clearly the parliament sat, albeit with some difficulties, but it sat. Laws were passed. And I don't think that the position of the Deputy Speaker being vacant or not would have affected the legality of those laws. So I would have hoped and I still hold out hope that the government will put, there's still time, I agree, but will put some emphasis into looking at the um, proposals made and recommendations made by the Constitutional Reform Commission. Let us not go and reinvent the wheel. I've heard that attempts have been made on several occasions to, to appoint a constitutional committee with members of the House and so forth. This was a bipartisan and non-partisan, I should say, review of the constitution, an in-depth review of the constitution. They went into detail, they looked at the Bill of Rights, what rights we should have, they looked at protection of the Queen's chain, they looked at a number of items and issues that were of importance to everyday St. Lucians. I, I don't want to say it was disregarded, but that's what it was at the time it was presented. And I'm hoping that with the majority that the government has, where it enables them to make the constitutional changes that they desire and they wish to, that they will look again at this reform com um, commission report, recognize the popularity of a lot of the suggestions that were made and recommendations that were made in it, and take the opportunity to make fundamental changes in our government, to, to ensure that going forward, our constitution continues to be vibrant and continues to reflect the aims, the desires, the goals of St. Lucia and St. Lucians. The bill, I believe, does have merit. It does have utility. I've heard the comments of the leader of opposition business with regard to whether we need to amend, have a referendum based on the need to ref, um, amend section 30. I've heard the response of, again, the self-deprecating new member of the, of the chamber. I've looked at the section, and I'll be honest, I think there are arguments and some merit on both sides. It's something that perhaps may have to go to more learned persons than myself to resolve. Um, it's not very clear from the section whether it's disjunctive or conjunctive, whether you do need to have a referendum or whether it applies only to, as the, was suggested by the, um, my, my new friend, whether it only applies to bills that have been rejected twice um, by virtue of Section 50 of the Constitution. So with those few words, again, I would like to encourage the government side to take a serious look at the Constitution Reform Commission report. It has been circulating far and wide for a number of years now, over 10 years. 
In fact, some of the recommendations might now be beyond, um, well, a little outdated. But that being said, I think we can still revisit it. We can still look and adopt the recommendations and thereby ensure that we have a vibrant constitution. And, and if you just permit me, sorry, um, Madam Chair, um, Madam President, uh, when I presented on the CCJ bill, I noted that one of my professional and personal peeves was the fact that our constitution, the document that we all claim is the fundamental document that we all adhere to, is merely um, subsidiary legislation out of the UK. When you look at the original document, it's SRO, and I can't remember the specific number. It's not even an act out of the UK. This was something that was done in the cabinet office, sorry, in the foreign office, and just handed to us, basically. I think it is vital and further continuation of our independent struggle. We've already um, demitted from the Privy Council. Let us indigenize our constitution. Let us make it our own in actual fact. Let us therefore adopt the recommendations of the commission and indigenize our constitution, make it our own by virtue of our own votes in our um, legislature, properly elected by the members of the Senusha electorate. Madam President, I support the amendment and those are my few comments on it. Thank you. Senator Jean. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, just I rise in support of the Constitution Amendment um, relating to the Deputy Speaker. And I just want to say that I see this amendment not only as a means of ensuring that what we saw in the unfortunate period um, real cool but I see it as a means of bringing back honor to the honorable house about two weeks ago I saw somewhere where this house where the house of assembly was referred to as this as the dishonorable house <clears throat> And in fact, Madam President, I wanted to ask from early morning whether the Speaker of the House had resigned. Because I heard somewhere outside that some members who boycotted the Senate would not return until the Speaker had resigned. I also heard reference to people being drunk and disorderly in the house. And I wondered which house was being referred to. But upon reflection, I always have to remind myself that people judge you based on how they judge themselves. I was reminded by some replays of what took place in the lower house during the unfortunate period where some people were asked to sit down, to behave, stop behaving like children, um, um, retract statements and they refused to. And there was a lot of disorder in the House of Assembly. Fortunately for us, Madam President, the people of St. Lucia were watching. So although they were not able to hear it from Constitution Park, certainly the media, and particularly social media, reminded us of what took place during the period 
2016 to 2021. <laughs> Regarding the appointment of the deputy speaker in particular, what I believe was the reason for us not having the benefit of a deputy speaker. In fact, we had one for a few minutes. I was right here in the house when the deputy speaker was elected. And then by the next day, there was no deputy speaker. I think that was a clear recognition that the substance of governance stood on the other side during that time. And that the leading party at the time was so threatened, although, like my friend Senator Daniel indicated that there was an 11-6 majority but the six was bigger than the 11. <laughs> so there was no way that they would have given up one of their 11 to be a deputy speaker. And I wanted to correct a slight statement which I think I heard Senator Daniel say, that by making one out of the 11 the deputy speaker they would have had 10. To my mind, Madam President, they would not have had 10, they would still have 11 because the deputy speaker would only be required in the absence of the speaker. So the 11 would still have been there. Madam President, during that unfortunate period, we saw a female speaker having to endure an entire proceedings for the whole day seated in that chair. We came back, there was a male speaker who had to adjourn the house if he had to take a break. Madam President, was that an effective use of the country's time, of the time of the people of St. Lucia? We're seeing in here at the upper house, when you, Madam President, have to take a break or have to, to leave for a short period of time, that our Deputy President takes the seat. In the lower house, there was never that opportunity and there was no one with the heart, with the heart for that for the two speakers to recognize that they would need a break. But we all saw during that period almost a complete disregard for the speaker. So it was not just the lack of appointment of the deputy speaker, but it was the complete disregard for the speaker to my mind. And so in the wisdom of this current government to rectify the situation so that this never ever happens again in the history of St. Lucia, I want to applaud the efforts and really look forward to there being adherence to the rule of law. But Madam President, sometimes when people are lawless, no matter what you do, they will break the law. It is just so unfortunate. But I'm hoping that this never ever happens again. Lastly, Madam President, I must agree with Senator Lee in advising the government to look through, to look back at the constitutional reform report and given the strong mandate which the people of St. Lucia has provided, make the necessary amendments so that we can have a smoother St. Lucia. Madam President, more and more I'm seeing 
that all of the transgressions that were made over the unfortunate period really took a toll on the people of St. Lucia and the people spoke resoundingly. A little again, the people of St. Lucia would have given this government a complete landslide of 17 knots. And so that ought to be a lesson to the opposition. That these little things, like when we believe that we will be disorderly in the house, we will run outside every minute. We, will, we cannot sit down in the chair as if it had poagwati. As if we, they give us a dweeve. People are watching and judging us by that. This in here is the business of the people of St. Lucia. We are in the legislature right here. We are making laws. Making laws to improve our country. And we cannot sit down. What is it? You know, I recall when as a school child at primary school, I questioned, but why do we have to wear uniform? Why do we have to come to school on time? Why do we have to do certain things? And I was told that was to teach us discipline. Mm -hmm. What we were told at school, what we were, we were forced to do at school, ought to have prepared us for situations like these. When we're sitting here, there were times at school when we wanted to go to the washroom and they told us, go back to your seat. We need to continue that discipline here in this house. It's, we should not play have here as if it's a playground. It is really dishonorable to have up and down, up and down. It's distracting, you know, and, 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 and you have people who are, you know, they run outside and they come back in and they hear your last word and they jump on your last word without putting it into context. There is need for greater honor to this house. The appointment of a deputy speaker outside of um, members of parliament ought is one little cob in that whole wheel to bring back the honor that is required in the House of Assembly on behalf of the people of St. Lucia. So I support the constitutional amendment, Madam President, and hope that we see better light in this space. Thank you. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Madam President. Under the current conditions, I really want to thank the members who contributed to this debate. I took particular note of Senator Lee's contribution. Um, he has his way of <clears throat> maintaining his position, particularly on matters that have legal and constitutional implications. Um, I, think, I take with good faith his particular recommendation that Senator Jean just spoke about, um, that the issue of going and paying attention to the Constitu Constitution Review Committee. Uh, Madam President, I just want to assure him that that discussion has actually taken place in other circles. And with the mandate that this government has, there are other constitutional considerations um, that we have to look at. So these will definitely include and involve the Constitutional Review Committee. In my explanation of the bill, I did make reference to that committee that was appointed in 2015 by the then Labour Party government to look at some of those particular um, changes. But unfortunately, the election was lost in 2016. The new government did not even pay attention to it. The committee never met. Nothing was done. But in our term, it is going to be different. He is correct that there may have been need to look at that committee and its recommendations as a whole, but this particular amendment uh, needed to be done. And so we are here. However, it doesn't mean that we will completely ignore 
the role and the composition, not the composition, but the, the formation of that committee and allow it to, to fulfill its, its, its um, responsibility. Um, on the matter of the leader of opposition business comments, uh, I think they have been adequately responded to by my previous colleagues uh, as far as the, the entire House having to make the decision and why not the opposition. Um, you know, we, we cannot ignore precedent when it has been set. Uh, that's part of dealing with law and uh, behavior legal on, on, on in legal matters as well as establish conventions as correctly espoused by the, up the, the independent senator. On the matter of the appointment of the Speaker of the House that he raised with regard to that person being a non-political figure, which I think is quite interesting. Um, just a bit of advice to the, the, the opposition, lead, lead of opposition business. If, if he really is, truly believes that this is necessary, I don't necessarily agree, but if he believes that this is necessary, that is a, rep, that is men, that's a mention of a huge political um, undertaking, almost a total philosophical change in the way we operate. My advice to him is to ask his colleagues, all you have to do is win the next election by a margin of more than two thirds. Hmm. and come in and make well, the change. Okay. Um, sometimes they say the things that others don't do, the best way to make sure it happens is to do it yourself. But in the, in the politics, you don't do things because you just have it in your mind. You have to have the mandate, people have to vote for you, and you have to have the, the numbers. So um, I think that would be a very practical approach. Um, if his leader starts to pay attention, and I think uh, there was a, a point made by one of my colleagues, Madam President, that it has, the opposition has not learned anything from what happened between 2016 and 2021. For the very reasons why the St. Lucian, St. Lucians decided to, as, to put it in the words of my colleague Senator, to relieve the government then of its inconvenience with a 15 to 2 beating or 15 to 2, you know, margin. The government, the opposition, has continued along the same lines, with the same attitude, with the same posture, with more of the same. I, I don't know, uh, why are we underestimating our St. Lucia? Our St. Lucia understand what's going on. So if you really want that speaker to be part of the equation, not being a political figure, that's okay. It's your, perhaps your philosoph philosophical position. I respect that. But in the... Uh, in the politics of the Westminster system, you have to get the majority. And so, maybe my best advice, maybe it's just advice, is do what you have to do, fix the problems that um, you have not dealt with since 2020, 2016, and give yourself a chance for the people of St. Lucia to give you the mandate required, and then you can come to this house, follow the procedure, and make the change that you want to see in others. At this point, Madam President, I want to end and ask that we have the amendment made to relieve our system, our government, and our constitution, and our people of that um, situation that we hope will never reoccur in the political life of this country. I thank you, Madam President. Senators, the question is that the Constitution of St. Lucia Amendment Number 2 Bill be read a second time. I now put the question, as many as are of that opinion, say aye. Aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. to amend the Constitution of St. Lucia Cap 1.01. .01. Whereas under Section 41.1 of the Constitution of St. Lucia Cap 1.01, .01, Parliament may alter any of the provisions of the Constitution, and whereas under Section 41.3 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, 
cap 1.01 a bill to alter any of the provisions of the constitution other than the provisions referred to in subsection 2 shall not be regarded as being passed by the house unless on its final reading in the house the bill is supported by the votes of not less than two-thirds of all the members of the house and whereas the provisions of the constitution of saint lucia cap 1.01 .01, are being altered by this act Clause 2. Substitution of Section 36. Clause 2 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 1. Short title. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. Aye. Senators, the question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. I now put the question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Senators, I beg to report that the Constitution of St. Lucia Amendment Number 2 Bill went through committee stage without amendments to close to any of the clauses, without amendments. Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I beg that the report of the committee be adopted, adopted and that the bill be read a third time and passed. Senators, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the Constitution of St. Lucia Amendment Number 2 Bill be read a third time and passed. I now put the question. As many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Be it enacted by the King's Most Excellent Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same as follows. This Act may be cited as the Constitution of St. Lucia Amendment No. 2 Act 2022. Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I move that this House do stand adjourned until Tuesday the 21st of, of March at 10 a.m. To be correct and, yes, to be correct politically and <laughs> constitutionally. Madam President, I move that this Senate stand suspended until Tuesday, the 21st of March at 10 in the 
Fonu. Senators, the question is that this Senate do stand suspended until Tuesday, the 21st of March, 2023, at 10 a.m. I now put the question. As many as of that opinion, say aye. Aye. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Sitting suspended until Tuesday, 21st March, 2023, at 10 a.m. Let me wish all senators a very safe and wonderful weekend. All right. The sitting has now been suspended. The, well, the three motions for debate today and the motions that were presented by the Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Finance and sorry, in the Ministry of Tourism and the leader of the government business, the Senator, the Honorable Gibian Ferdinand, he presented the motions um, for the borrowing of um, 3.5 million EC dollars for the purpose of assisting with working capital requirements for um, the corona virus and also there was also the motion for the borrowing of funds to assist the St. Jude Hospital as well as the motion for the the hospital complex that's the medical complex so this and also there was also the discussion and um, the bills on the constitution amendment bill um, that was for the deputy speaker that is uh, the bill that was passed in in the lower house or lower chamber that was passed um, last week and so the Senate has now ratified it so to speak and so they've now um, adjourned the sitting to to Tuesday the 21st of of February at 10am Akweol Magadi Jodia la tenir des fois enfin trois des fois motion il était passé en cas en cas constitué des fois um membre sénat là participé était était bien bien appréciable chaque des fois on parlait um comme la coutume c'est face à l'opposition était là ça c'est chef face à l'opposition on est sénateur sénateur um Fede, Dominique Fede, et <laughs> aussi, mais ça qui était intéressant, c'est le um, sénateur Neuf pour Junior, qui c'est sénateur Shelton Daniel, qui était apprenti aujourd'hui pour replacer deux sénateurs qui partaient présents, ça c'est le sénateur um, Pauline, Pros, um, Antoine, Pauline Antoine Prosper, qui pas un pays à présent et aussi sénateur Lisa Jawai qui parle. So, sénateur Shelton Daniel qui a apporté un um, pour Jodia seulement pour vous replacer avec um, il parler à ces différents à ces différentes présentations et um, aussi différents monde parler. So, um, toutes ces différents sénateurs c'était c'était bien intéressant Jodia. Eh bien, ça nous a dit que c'était une un, un belle, belle discussion comme la coutume avec nous. Ka, oui, merci pour rester pour nous, uh, pour cette discussion ça qui passe. Je, comme ça nous a fait ici à, à sous NTN. Avec ce plaisir nous pour vivre maintenant ça qui a passé en consulte avec aussi en Sénète là. Nous avons vivre ici à ça c'est um, Madi. Madi 21, oui, Madi 21, comme Madame Président dit, nous avons dévié ici à Madi, avec aussi mercredi pour Kai Concept. Et puis ça, nous avons dédié, bonsoir, avec un bon finissement semaine.